In the depths of Chorgon prison, held down by chains and immobile by a turtle shell, a broken warrior had been imprisoned for two decades. He opened his eyes as deep yellow pierced through the dark. Once filled with hatred and rage, his eyes now held the wisdom and depth of two souls, two lives. One was Tai Lung, the son of Master Shifu, born in ancient China where Kung Fu ruled supreme. The other was also Tai Lung, the son of man, born in a modern world where his current world was nothing but fiction. Two lives, two souls, now one entity. He was armed with knowledge he should not possess and the wisdom of two lifetimes. So when he breaks out from the chain of his imprisonment, he not only breaks the physical chains but also the chains of fate and destiny. Destined to be a villain, a stepping stone for the dragon warrior, he became something more. He should not have happened, he was an anomaly, a variable beyond the calculation of the universe. His existence had changed everything in the universe. He smiled, knowing that the old tortoise was not so wise, because he was wrong. There are accidents. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Is your boy, Omni-sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn as Tai Lung, God of Kung Fu, Part 1. If you see the like button at an anime expo, dupe him into shouting that One Piece is boring and too long in front of unsuspecting One Piece fans. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. Third POV. In the courtyard of the Jade Palace, which overlooked the Valley of Peace, there sat an aged red panda who was playing a flute. It was Master Shurfu. His form looked calm and peaceful, a martial artist would call it vulnerable. Five people stalked his serene self as they awaited for a chance to attack. The chance came when Tigris, their unofficial leader, sprang into action. Five people, five masters of martial arts, attacked Master Shurfu whose lazy eyes suddenly took a knowing shape awareness glazed over them. Then after that, in a show of martial prowess and expertise, Master Shurfu instantly subdued the five people. Their attacks met their end as Master Shurfu skillfully redirected them to the ground, to themselves, or easily stopped them even with his smaller frame. The five people were known as the Furious Five. They were famous all over China and hailed as the prodigies of their generation. This was proven true when they claimed victory in the Battle of Weeping River against an army that outnumbered them by a thousand to one. But their opponent this time was proven to be more formidable than a mere five thousand soldiers. It was their master, the one who taught them everything they knew, be it about martial arts or about life. Master Shifu, a name renowned all over China as the best martial arts teacher, for not only teaching the Furious Five and other masters, but a certain villain as well. Well done, students! Master Shurfu started with a smile and a bright tone. If you are trying to disappoint me, Master Shurfu finished, his voice taking the tone of a stern and strict teacher who barely held back a disappointed scowl. Tigress, you need more ferocity. Monkey, greater speed. Crane, height. Viber, subtlety. He told them while pointing at each one as he addressed them. Although famous all over China for their skills and respected by other masters, the Furious Five could never attain a satisfactory standard in their master's eyes. They needed to do better. But his teaching was cut short when a duck, who worked in the Jade Palace, interrupted. Master Shurfu! What? The duck stopped on his track, a bit scared in the presence of Master Shurfu, who was always closed off and unapproachable to others. But orders came from a higher power. Master Ugwe wants to see you. Master Shurfu paused, wondering why he was summoned so suddenly. But it didn't take him even a second to run towards the Jade Palace after that. Just like he was a respected master to the Furious Five, Master Ugwe was his master. With his incredible speed, he reached the Jade Palace in mere moments. He was greeted with the sight of Master Oogwe who was meditating near a pool. Master Ugwe, you summoned me? Is something wrong? Master Shurfu asked while doing a respectful bow, with his fist meeting the palm of his hand. Why must something be wrong for me to want to see my old friend? Master Ugwe was an old tortoise who looked like someone who could fondly recall the birth of the sun like a childhood memory. His wrinkled body spoke of centuries of experience, and his eyes held knowledge twice that. Yet he was still the strongest master alive today. So, 
Nothing's wrong? Master Shurfu asked while looking at Ugwe, who was now blowing out the candles surrounding the pool. Well, I didn't say that, Master Ugwe said, voice tinged with amusement. Shurfu awaited for Ugwe to speak more and elaborate exactly what was wrong, but the tortoise was more interested in his candles as he blew them out one by one. They numbered in thousands. Shaifa's eyebrows twitched before he performed a technique that blew out all the candles at once. Again, displaying his incredible mastery over Kung Fu. Ugwe simply smiled fondly, impressed at the innovative action his disciple had taken. Then he turned towards Shurfu and wet his dry mouth to speak. I have had a vision. Ugwe started. You could see worry amongst the vast ancient knowledge in his eyes. The world stilled for Shurfu when he heard what came out of Ugwe's mouth, and his mind broke out in a fit of panic as bad memories surged. The world also took a sharp turn as the previous clear sky darkened. Thunder followed, as if the words spoken were lighting that struck change in the mortal realm. Tai Lung will return. Tai Lung's POV it's been so long. So long in fact that I have forgotten the sensation of sunlight blinding my eyes, the different tastes upon my tongue, or the playful wind caressing my fur. It has been 630,700,000 seconds, or 20 years. Seriously, it has been 20 years. Let that sink in 20 damn years. 20 years of darkness. 20 years of hunger. 20 years of isolation. 20 years of cold. 20 years of immobility. It was 20 years of imprisonment. Over what? A freaking scroll? Damn it. I didn't even kill anyone. I merely destroyed a few villages in my tantrum, but that did not warrant a punishment like this. Twenty years was a long time. It was a lifetime for many people yet here I am, rotting away in some cave, incapable of doing anything. And the sole reason behind it was that I got a little mad when some old tortoise denied me something I had worked my entire for. I swear, if the annals of time had not claimed the life of that old reptile by now, I will when I eventually get out of the shithole. But I wouldn't say my time spent here was a complete waste of time as I was able to recall my other life in another world due to the sheer boredom of this place. Yes, as strange as it sounds, that was what happened. As I was imprisoned here, left in the dark and incapable of even moving a single muscle, I got memories of another life. A life where I was a human and lived in a world where my current world was nothing but fictional. Pretty crazy, right? At first, it was confusing. Then it was scary as I felt myself changing and influenced by this other life I had. My mindset altered, my personality influenced, and my heart forever changed. I was scared, I was alone, and I had existential crises. But 20 years was long enough for me to settle every issue and find inner peace. After a decade or so, I managed to find peace in myself and my identity. I am Tai Lung. Anyways, those memories and changes proved to be beneficial in this isolation as they not only quelled my anger and hatred, they gave me a different perspective on everything, and I was able to strike a balance between myself. But most importantly, it gave me hope as with the memories, comes knowledge about my world which was fictional in my previous. So I knew the time was coming near. Twenty years had elapsed and now begins the canon. I will be freed from this prison I just needed to wait some more, and then I would be able to do as I wish and finally settle the scores. Inner peace did not equate to forgiveness. I still have many grudges and an ambition to realize. Just a few more days. I could hear the universe speak to me. A few more days. Tai Lung's POV Krogom Prison. It was a stronghold carved right out of the most inaccessible peak of the Taven Bogd Mountains at 3,000 feet deep, located in the frigid outskirts of Mongolia. It was the most formidable prison ever made and was designed with only one entrance and one exit. It was built with elaborate traps and deathly, self-destructive mechanisms that should prevent anyone from escaping. This fortress was built with the sole purpose of holding one prisoner. Me, it might seem like too much effort to hold one prisoner at first, but that would be wrong. In fact, it was not enough to hold me in the canon timeline. I was kept in the deepest part of the cavern and both my arms were chained up as huge boulders weighed at the end of my chains. My hands were also cuffed with eight-point acupuncture cuffs that not only tightened more as I struggled, it also stopped my chi and made me unable to move my fingers as even my claws were forever retracted. On my back was a huge restraining turtle shell, made by Ugwe himself as thick pins were inserted in the acupuncture points on my back, effectively stopping me from moving a single muscle while also blocking my chi, my restraints were so good that I could not even breathe as I wanted, only being able to take in just enough air to not die. A part of me even forgot how to move my body, and I wonder whether I would remember how to move once I was free. I might lose all my motor skills. It was a cruel punishment, it would be better to kill someone than keep them like this. 
It was like being in an eternal coma conscious yet not living. I hated them for this. They refused to kill me due to their self-righteousness and would instead opt for this kind of imprisonment so that they could feel good and be void of guilt. Dying was mercy compared to this. I have not even eaten or drank in 20 years. The only reason I was alive was due to my body being in a state of complete immobility and because of my strong chi it was like a hibernation, if that made sense. Other than my tail due to many nerve endings, my eyes and my lungs, I could not even feel other parts of my body. I wonder how much longer I will be in this state. The sound of the wooden platform hitting the ground and bridging the space between my rock island and the guard post woke me up from my reverie. The disturbing sound was followed by the familiar voice of the commander of the prison. Crossbows at the ready, he said, and I could feel multiple crossbows aiming at me, ready to kill at a moment's notice. My warrior's instinct screamed at me to move. My mind was extremely uncomfortable being in this state of gunpoint. It was repulsed at the idea of my safety being in another person's hand. Yet I was powerless. But not for long, oh it's here. It is time. I thought to myself as I heard the laughter and heavy footfalls of the commander. He was the commander of the Anvil of Heaven. An elite warrior of 1,000 rhinos who were posted in the Chorgom prison to guard me. A thousand soldiers to guard one prisoner. Ha 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 ha. Hey tough guy. Have you heard? Vatcher, the commander, came up to me and said with a condescending tone in his voice. He was showing absolute disrespect to me again like he had done for the past two decades. Ugwe is finally going to give the dragon scroll to someone, and it's not going to be you. He said as the torch he was carrying gave me a much needed warmth in the frigid cave since my body was restrained to the point I could not even produce proper body heat. What are you doing? Don't get him mad, said a duck in a half whisper, half shouting. If memory serves me right, it was the duck that was supposed to deliver a message from Shurfu. The message was to double the defense and guards of Krogon prison. What's he gonna do? He is completely immobilized. Thatcher said while walking around me. He even stepped on my tail to prove his point. I held back a growl as I allowed myself to stay calm and quiet. Oh, did I step on your tail? Kitty cat? Ha 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 ha, Thatcher laughed. Not realizing that his actions were the same as digging a grave for himself. Okay, that's good. I have seen enough. I will make sure to tell Master Shurfu that everything is okay said the duck with evident fear in his voice as he stumbled to leave. Thatcher followed him as well and they left me alone. But right when I heard the wooden door closing, I opened my eyes. My yellow eyes pierced through the darkness and I looked at the ground to see a single feather of the duck. I smiled and moved my tail to grab the feather. The fact that Thatcher had stepped on my tail turned out to be a great thing, as it woke up the nerves in my tail and allowed me to control it with perfect dexterity. Without wasting any time, I picked up the feather with my tail and inserted it in the keyhole of the turtle shell fitted on my back. My tail moved like it had a mind of its own as it started using the light feather to pick the lock of the shell that was restraining me. I have thought of this moment and dreamed this moment for a long time. I have memories of reading how this lock worked, plus it was not the first time I had tried picking the lock. Therefore, in no time I was able to crack open the shell of restraint on my back. Sush the shell loosened, and I finally took a full breath in two decades. Hiya! It was amazing how one full breath could rejuvenate my strength. I felt the oxygen fill my lungs before it got past to my blood, and my muscles fed on that oxygen like hungry beasts. Finally, I said as I sucked in the air, causing small hurricanes to form near my nose. With that being said, I flexed the muscles on my back and forcefully pushed out the needles inserted into my back. They shot out like bullets and with the final shift, the shell broke completely. Asterisk crack! Asterisk I felt untold strength surged back to me as my muscles popped and worked for the first time in 20 years. My nerves fired up and I finally got back full possession over my body, which was born to kill and trained for war. I felt intoxicated with my own power, as the sudden shift from being completely helpless to being capable of destroying mountains was too sudden. I let out a roar. Asterisk roar. Asterisk I am free. Tai Lung's POV I am free. The sound of an arrow the size of a spear cutting through the air at a speed illogically fast made my body lean back on instinct. The sharp edge of the spear barely ruffled my fur as it lodged itself on the ground beside me. The arrow was fast, but my instincts could glimpse at the future. My lips stretched into a smile, showing my canines that could and have ripped through the toughest armor. I basked in the glory of my strength and might. I was unbetrayed by the skills and the techniques I have mastered, even after two decades. Not only that, but I remained unweakened by the time of my imprisonment. 
and although I knew it was obvious, I couldn't help myself from being glad and relieved of that fact. Swoosh! X5 five more arrows launched at me, and the sound of their approach only reached my ear after they were inches away from me. Such was the speed of the arrows. A crossbow was made to be powerful, sacrificing the long range of a bow in exchange for ruthless speed and penetrative power. Coupled with the fact that we were in a tight, closed space of a cave, the arrows should be able to kill any other warrior. Yet as the sharp end of the arrows foretold certain death, I did not falter, and with three movements stitched into one, I dodged the spear-sized arrows with unwavering confidence. Boom! X55 arrows lodged themselves in the very ground I stood at. They were mere inches away from me, yet only I knew how far they were from reaching me. I observed the angle which the arrows were planted in and looked towards the direction they came from. The machine crossbows were in something like a bird's nest on the side of the cave. The weapons were three in total and operated by six rhinos. That was stupid. They should have stationed the three crossbows at three different places with three different angles. I growled at them, and they cowered under my piercing gaze. One of them flinched and shot out an arrow by accident. The arrow was going to miss me, but I used it as a chance to free myself as I let the arrow hit the eight acupuncture cuff on my right hand. Ting metal hit metal. Crack. Finally, my right hand was freed from the cuffs which were restraining my hand and blocking my chi. I looked at my arm and let out my claws for the first time in 20 years. They were the weapons I was blessed with. I have never bothered to use any other external weapon as my claws were always sharp enough to tear and rip through anything I considered my enemy. I used my right hand to free my left hand which was still chained and cuffed. My claws easily ripped through the iron they were made of. But I did not let go of the chains that wrapped around my left hand. I grabbed the chain with both my arm and pulled it as hard as I could. The kinetic energy traveled like waves through the chain. Ha! I swung the chain over my shoulder and the huge boulder that was tied at the end crashed into the place where the crossbows were kept. The screams of terror from the six rhinos were followed by the sound of an earthquake as the boulder crushed them to a pulp. Blood and flesh splattered on the walls of the cave as the boulder remained suspended there. Ah, violence. How I missed this. I said to myself and got on all fours as I stretched my body like any feline would after staying in the same place for a long time. My muscles stretched and trembled in relief. My bones snapped and fit into place like pieces of a puzzle. The fur on my back stood up as I let myself go. If it was not for my pride as a warrior, I would have purred. That's more like it, I said with a happy smile unfitting of someone who just ruthlessly killed six people. But then, the noisy sound from above disturbed me, and I was forced to look up. Many bridges, similar to the Great Wall of China, were connecting different sides of the cave and I saw many soldiers stationed in those bridges. The army of soldiers, or the anvil of heaven as they called themselves, were all looking down at me with a bow and arrow in their hand. Ready! The voice of the commander echoed through the cave. Oh! I thought to myself, realizing the situation. Fire! Asterisk few. Asterisk X993. An uncountable number of arrows shot down at me. They were of such quantity that they managed to block my vision completely, casting a despairing shadow like the dark clouds before a storm. It was raining. It was raining arrows and there were so many that no matter where I went, I wouldn't be able to escape. Pathetic. I commented while picking up two of the arrows in both hands. They were big enough to be used as spears, albeit a little light. They were straight and balanced since they were arrows, and that was enough for me. The arrows turned into spears in my expert hand as I spun them rapidly and faced the incoming rain of arrows. It only took one swift swing of both weapons and all of the arrows that was aiming for me got swept away. Meanwhile, the rest of the arrows simply did not hit me at all. This was why I called their attempts pathetic. Although it might look scary at first and prevent you from dodging, the attack power was nothing and the arrows that reached me were only around 20 while the rest went to waste. It was a good method for war, but a horrible method to use on one person. Incompetent. I spat out, feeling offended that such incompetent soldiers were put to guard me. But their incompetence knew no bound as they shot another rain of arrows at me, even with my previous display. I swiped away the arrows like I did before and took a good look at the bridge made of rock where they stood. You guys have an awful lot of trust in those rocks. I said and tossed the two spears I held in my hand. I bent down to pick up the other three spears and toss them in the air as well. Then I jump up and proceeded to punch the end of two spears and kicked the rest of the spears. In a show of unimaginable strength and precision, the five spears shot out like cannons after I hit them at their end. The spears cut through the air and even with the constant pulling of gravity, my power forced them to fly up until they hit their target. 
The rhinos standing at the nearest bridge pulled back to hide and none of the spears hit them. Instead, they hit the bottom of the bridge and lodged themselves there. Ha ha! He missed! One of the rhinos exclaimed in relief, but that was short-lived as they all heard a crack the next moment. Crack webs of cracks rapidly expanded at the bottom of the bridge as the rhinos standing on top of it realized what was happening. They screamed and tried to run away but all that constant moving did nothing but quicken the inevitable as the rocky bridge broke into pieces and collapsed. Rhinoceros were the second heaviest animal on land, right after elephants. So it was beyond stupid for a hundred or so of them to occupy one bridge made of stone. Ah! N-O-O-O! -O -O. Ra! Their screams of horror and despair bounced off the cave walls, multiplying the sound and making it louder. It was a pleasant music to my ears. All those condescending voices, those ridicule, and all the jokes they cracked in my name through the years, flashed in my mind. Their voice was better when they screamed. I liked their cries, far better than I liked their laughters. Ha 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 ha. I let out a laugh while opening my arms. Only a few seconds ago arrows were raining, but now, it was the bodies of the soldiers and debris of the collapsed bridge that was raining down on me. I cracked my neck and with a deep-throated roar, I ran on all fours and leaped at the wall of the cave. My claws, both from my feet and hands, dug into the rocks as I ran up the vertical wall as if I was running on normal ground. When the bodies of the soldiers reached me, I jumped on them and used them as a footing to leap higher and higher. Their screams got further and further as they fell into the bottom of the cave, to their deaths. Krogom was no longer a prison that held Tai Lung but instead, it was their graveyard. I used the fallen bodies and debris as footholds, propelling myself up to the closest bridge. I landed on the bridge with a thud and the soldiers, who were looking down at their falling allies in fear, turned to me. No one dared make a sound or move as I slowly rose to my feet. I deeply frowned at them and showed off my canines. A deep growl rolled off my throat as it seemed to shake the very air with its vibration. Please. I dash, the guy was the first victim as I moved at a speed their eyes could not follow, and their heavy bodies could never hope to react to. My fist met his jaw as his teeth broke out with a mixture of blood and spit. Whatever plea of mercy he was about to spew was cut off to remain forever unheard. Then I spun around and kicked his side, sending his huge body to fly off the bridge and fall to his death like his comrades. All of this happened in the span of a single second, the other soldiers were too shocked and scared to even react. Their big and durable body was nothing more than a training dummy to me as I blurred from one place to another. Unfortunately, I was in a hurry as there was a self-destruct mechanism in the prison. Therefore, I had no time to play around or show them mercy. Everyone I attacked, I killed immediately by either throwing them off the bridge or cutting their vital parts with my claw. Maybe if there was no self-destruct mechanism, I would play around and maybe spare three or four attacks for each of them. This would be better than receiving one swift killer attack. Maybe they would have met my punches or kicks instead of my claws, which reaped their life one by one. It was truly ironic. The very thing they designed to make sure I never escape my imprisonment caused them to meet the end they could never escape from. Death. Third POV Vatcher, the commander of the Army Anvil of Heaven, had never felt fear quite like he was feeling now. He was a soldier, a commander even, and he had faced countless battles and had fought in multiple wars. Yet he had never felt this kind of fear before. He knew fear, but whenever he was faced with fear, there was always hope. In a battle, there was the threat of death, but there was also the hope for life and victory. Every fight he has had, every enemy he had dealt with, there was always a chance of victory alongside death and defeat. But not this time. This time, there was only fear and despair. He can't win. He wouldn't live. Especially not after what he had done to Tai Lung all these years, laughing and ridiculing him. There was no hope. And the chance of defeating Tai Lung? That thought could not even come to his mind as he looked down at the scene. Tai Lung was a blur of gray that moved swiftly like the wind yet he devastated everywhere he went like an earthquake. No soldier could survive more than one exchange with him as they were killed left and right. Vatcher never knew life could be taken so ruthlessly and so quickly. Tai Lung threw one soldier in the air. It was a show of frightening strength as the rhino's heavy body and armor flew up like a pillow. Then before the soldier even hit the ground, Tai Lung had killed every single one of his comrades that was stationed at the same bridge. The soldier never hit the bridge as Tai Lung softly kicked his body, redirecting his trajectory, and he fell down the bottomless bit of the cave. Tai Lung paused and then looked up. His eyes pierced through Vatcher's eyes and then his soul. He couldn't help but shiver. His gigantic body, which was trained for violence and has experienced countless wars, took a step back in fear. 
He stumbled as he cowered away. His armor became a burden as his legs almost gave out. He couldn't help but shiver. His gigantic body, which was trained for violence and has experienced countless wars, took a step back in fear. He stumbled as he cowered away. His armor became a burden as his legs almost gave out. Yet this time it provides no comfort. Couldn't. Not in front of Tai Lung who was famous throughout China for his strength. It was said that only Master Ugwe could beat him. His armor became dead weight. He took off his armor and threw it to the side. His eyes stood firm even when his body cowered. You really shouldn't have angered him, the messenger duck from the Jade Palace commented. You're not helping, Vatcher gruffed as he prepared for the next course of action. If he was going to die, then at least he would die as an honorable commander. Sodders! He screamed, his voice echoing in the cave. Retreat to the top level. On his command, the soldiers, who were all fearful but stayed in their position just because of their order, ran away. Tai Lung simply raised an eyebrow before running up the walls again. He cleared out everyone that remained on the bridge and slowly got up to the last bridge. Remain near the gate. We will have our final stand there. Thatcher ordered. Remember, we are protecting the whole of China from this monster. Don't let him destroy the land with his evil. Take up arms and fight to protect. All of the remaining soldiers gathered near the exit of the cave as they prepared a final stand. Vatcher calmed his cowering heart as he stood in front of his army. His body was telling him to flee but the responsibility on his shoulders was too heavy to run away. He was the commander. He would die, yes, but it would be an honorable death against the ultimate enemy. Tai Lung's POV I allowed the soldier to run away and let them gather at the exit, as their huge bodies and numbers blocked my way to freedom. Asterisk dash Asterisk I reached the last bridge that should lead towards the exit, but I did not stop there and instead, continued running on the wall. My claws sank into the rocks as my agile body scaled the height with ease. I was made for this as a snow leopard. My natural habitat was in the mountains. I finally reached the ceiling of the cave where huge stalactites hang like chandeliers. They were huge spikes that were made naturally by erosion. I took a giant leap and hung on one of the spikes before I climbed up. It was then that I found what I was searching for. Dynamites. I grabbed them with my hand, and I was easily able to pull them all off as they were all interconnected with a fuse. With the explosives in my hand, I finally landed on the bridge with a thud. The army had already gathered near the exit, and they were all staring at me with their mouth wide open in shock. This must have been their last hope, but I easily snuffed out their hope with my future knowledge. But then again, it's not like it would work anyway. I threw the explosives off the bridge and they fell down to the bottom of the cave which was not even visible at this point since it was so deep. I clapped as if removing imaginary dust and I finally let out a smile of relief. Move, you are in my way. I told them as my smile flipped into a frown. The atmosphere becomes tense and they had a hard time breathing, as if they had just realized the low amount of oxygen in the cave. Their body froze in fear and you could hear an audible gulp in the silence. But the rhinos stood unmoving and continued to be a hindrance. We won't let you get out so easily, Tai Lung. Your time of evil is over. The anvil of heaven will stop you, the commander said, and he even had the gall to use a righteous tone. Evil? What the hell have I done to be called such a thing? I merely destroyed a few houses in the valley of peace and anger, and you guys are treating me like pure evil, I said with a sigh. Have they forgotten all the other times I have saved China? In the end, I knew the answer was dot that I was too strong. Before I was imprisoned here, I was famous all over China as one of the strongest Kung Fu masters. I have traveled around different cities, challenging and defeating different Kung Fu masters and also defeating entire armies by myself. Could be said that people were afraid of me, what if I turned against them? And my outburst was a good excuse to put me away for good. Don't lie to us, Master Ugwe have seen through your evil heart, the commander said and he got nods from his soldiers. Right, that was also one of the reasons why they put me here. Ugwe lived for hundreds of years and was basically like a Buddha, what he said can't be wrong. And how old is he exactly? He had gone senile, I said and slumped my shoulder in mock sadness. You know what? Forget it, I said as I put one foot forward, ready to charge at them. I am giving a chance for everyone to run away one last time. You can't stop me, I said as my voice got an octave deeper. The anvil of heaven. You guys are only a thousand, you think that is enough to stop me? I have mastered the thousand scrolls of Kung Fu. I can use a different technique to kill each and every one of you individually. 
I said and I could see their strong faces slowly beginning to break. On the count of three, I will kill anyone remaining here. One, the soldiers looked around, reading each other's faces to see what they were thinking. Two, I saw the soldiers girt their teeth as the young soldiers who had never seen war started crying. Three, and then, what? I am not going to die such a meaningless death, one of them said and pushed the door open before fleeing. It took one coward to convince everyone else. Fear spread like an infection as they began fleeing one by one. But as more and more started running away, the idea of running seemed not so embarrassing, so more and more joined in. Until only the duck and the commander were left. The other soldiers have all run away. Would you look at that? I said. My voice was mocking. Such remarkable army you are leading. Peals of laughter left my throat before I suddenly shot forward and hit the commander right in his chest. Asterisk boom. Asterisk gah. He threw up blood mixed with spit. In one swift movement, I took hold of his giant horn and hit his chin with my knee. I pulled the horn as hard as I could while doing so and I ripped it off. He let out a guttural scream before I stabbed him right at his heart with his broken horn. He stopped screaming and I stared at his eyes. A growl instinctively rolled off my throat as he staggered back. For the final attack, I delivered a palm strike right at his horn, which caused the stab to go deeper and he died just like that. I turned towards the duck who was looking at all this with horror in his face. He had stayed around for all this time because he was a messenger. And you don't hurt a messenger. But he seemed to be more and more unsure of that fact as we locked eyes. Until eventually he let out a scream and ran outside. Ha ha ha. Am I that scary? I asked myself while following right behind. But before I went out of the cave, I took the torches fixed on the walls and threw them down to the bottom of the cave. Then I went out of the prison and the harsh wind of the frigid mountain greeted me. Everything was covered in snow and there was a perpetual spine-chilling gale. I looked around the mountains and even with such weather, I felt comfortable. I was a snow leopard, this was my natural habitat. I was not only meant to survive in such a climate but to thrive in it. Freedom at last, I said. I looked around the surrounding and saw a rock nearby. I picked it up and tested the weight. Then I looked to the sky and threw the rock. It flew up and my aim stayed true as it hit the messenger who was trying to fly away from me. Ouch! He screamed and fell back on the mountain. I went to the place where he fell and grabbed him by the neck before he could fly away again. Ha, don't be scared. I am not going to hurt you, after all. I want you to deliver a message, I said and pat the small head of the duck. But before that, tell me, how is Shurfu doing this day? I asked. I loosed the grip I had on his neck and he choked out and answered. He's doing good. He's doing well. He took five disciples after your imprisonment and they are famous throughout China. None of them could compare to you, of course, he... He added in fear. I see, I said. Fly back to Shurfu now and tell him to prepare a feast. I am coming home. I tossed him in the air and he flapped his little wings until he disappeared from view. Right then, the whole mountain shook as if it was experiencing a volcanic eruption. The prison I just left behind exploded as huge flames shot out from the entrance. The shockwave caused the mountain to crumble and I could see that an avalanche was sure to follow. I let out a laugh. It seemed the dynamite finally caught on fire due to the torch I threw down. What a great way to start, I said and ran down the mountain before the disaster that followed could catch me. Third POV in the Valley of the Peace, the sound of the morning bell could be heard. It was a sound that signifies the start of a new day, the beginning of tomorrow. Good morning, Master. The Furious Five greeted Master Shurfu as they all stood outside of their room. Master Shurfu looked at them one by one with stern eyes and he noticed that one of them was missing. The new resident of the Jade Palace, Shurfu's new disciple and the so-called Dragon Warrior was nowhere to be found. Panda, Master Shurfu called out as he looked towards the room of the Dragon Warrior. Getting no response, he let out a sigh and went inside the room. He slammed open the door. Wake up, Panda! He paused as he looked at the empty room. There was no one inside and from the condition of the room, it seemed like no one had even slept there. Master Shurfu let out pleased chuckles as he thought the panda had finally realized he didn't belong there. He's quit, he said and he was pleased. He did not know why Master Ogwe had chosen the chubby panda as the new dragon warrior but Master Shurfu definitely did not support the decision. So, the fact that panda had quit was good news to him. It was proof that his condescending thought that the panda could never be the dragon warrior was right. He and his disciples went out of their room and headed towards the training ground of the Jade Palace. 
Master Shurfu had a permanent shadow of a smile as they climbed up the mountain to reach the training grounds. What do we do now, Master? With the panda gone, who will be the dragon warrior? Viper asked her master as they made their way up the mountain. All we can do is resume our training and trust that in time, the real dragon warrior will reveal themselves, Shurfu said and pushed open the door to the training ground. And lo and behold, the real dragon warrior was in the training ground, stuck in a split position with both legs on a makeshift bamboo platform. Master Shurfu lost his smile instantly as he gazed at the awkward posture of the panda. He seemed to be doing his own disastrous training. What are you doing here? Shurfu asked with a big frown, to which the panda simply turned back. Good morning, master. I thought I'd warm up a little, said while secretly trying to get out of his position. But alas, he could not. He was too heavy. Master Shurfu grabbed his head and let out a sigh. Really? This was the dragon warrior who was destined to defeat his prodigious son Tai Lung? There is a higher chance of Tai Lung turning good than this stupid panda defeating him. Whatever, it seemed he needed to try harder to make sure the panda quit by tomorrow. He couldn't have someone like him be the dragon warrior. The topic of the dragon warrior was a sensitive subject for Shurfu since his son Tai Lung was rejected for that title. He expected someone great and a never-before-seen genius to hold the title Tai Lung could not attain. Now, Master Ugwe was telling him that this panda was worthy while Tai Lung wasn't. It irked his pride the wrong way and caused a storm of rebellious feeling in his heart. His son, who had worked hard his whole life, his pride and joy, was rejected. And you're telling him that the panda was more worthy? He couldn't accept it. This was just an absolute disregard of his own and Tai Lung's dignity. The fact that this fat panda was the dragon warrior. Master Shurfu refused to believe that. Tai Lung's POV. He is a warrior like nothing the world has ever seen. A warrior of black and white. An odd reminiscence of the symbol of yin and yang. He embodies the balance of the universe of both good and bad. It is said that he fell out of the sky in a ball of fire. I am not gonna lie, it almost sounded cool. Even when I knew that it was nothing but an exaggeration. Po was almost exactly the opposite of that. But words spread by mouth seemed to escalate like wildfire. The story got exaggerated more and more as it was passed on. It sounds like he must be a formidable opponent. I said while eating the porridge I had in front of me. There were also other dishes like noodles and dumplings on the table before me. I was currently in the tavern of the first village I could find. I haven't eaten anything in 20 years. So you could imagine how hungry I was. So I decided to have a feast before continuing my journey to the Valley of Peace. After all, unlike the original Tai Lung, I was not blinded by rage or hatred to run towards the Valley of Peace the moment I got out. Let me enjoy my freedom for a bit. Not only that, I was on the outskirts of Mongolia so I had to travel across China to reach the Valley of Peace. It would take more than a month of normal travel but if I ran without stopping, I could cover the distance in two weeks. So there was no reason for me to hurry. I will give myself four weeks to make the journey. The original Tai Lung was foolish to immediately run towards the Valley of Peace. When he reached there, he was probably not even at full strength, as he would have been tired from making such a long journey. I did not need to hurry like him, it's not like they could run from me anyways. Are you kidding? Of course, he would be formidable. He is the dragon warrior. The pig who was the owner of the tavern said with a laugh. The other animals in the tavern also laughed along with him at my seemingly stupid question. Of course the dragon warrior was strong. He was prophesied to be the strongest warrior in China. Ha, if only they knew. I continued eating my food and ignored the noisy crowd. The food tasted amazing at first, but the more I ate, the more mundane it seemed to get. Well, anything you eat after two decades would be good, so maybe the food was never remarkable in the first place. But there was also a certain factor why the food was so bland. There is no meat. As one might expect, there was no meat in the world of Kung Fu Panda. Everyone was a vegetarian, even the predatory animals. Eating meat would be considered cannibalism here. Even throughout my life as Tai Lung, I have never eaten meat. But I have memories about my other life where I did not only enjoy meat, but it was my main diet. So I couldn't help but crave meat. And who could blame me? I was a predator, I was meaty to eat meat. Not noodles and stupid dumplings. I looked at the owner of the tavern who also happened to be a pig. My eyes narrowed as his image was replaced with a crispy bacon in my mind. Eep! The little chubby pig flinched and moved away from me. W what are you looking at? I shrugged. Nothing. I looked away and resumed eating my food. I need to keep these intrusive thoughts away, lest I might actually try cannibalism. Hopefully other vegans foods like Poe's noodles were better than this. 
Speaking of my other life, in my life there, I was also called Tai Lung. I was born in China and had an unhealthy passion for martial arts and fighting. I trained my whole life in different Chinese martial arts and kung fu. After I learned everything, I was determined to enter the UFC and prove to the world that Chinese kung fu were real and useful in combat. I was about to make a revolution like Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan and introduce a different aspect of kung fu to the world. Sadly, I died in a plane crash when I was on my way to America. I took a big swig of wine to clear away my thoughts. The way I went out was unfortunate, with all of my efforts going to waste before I accomplished my dreams. Thank you for the food. I cupped my fist with my palm and bowed in gratitude. Then I got up from my seat and head for the exit. Hey! You haven't paid for the food or wine. The owner, a middle-aged pig called out in anger. I'll pay next time, I said and tried to reach for the door but a giant buffalo blocked my way. Didn't you hear Mr. Chun? He said you need to pay, he said and towered over me. The other customers of the restaurant also looked our way as some fighters stood up and got ready for conflict. You see, Mr. Chen here is a friend of ours who has been serving us food and wine for a long time. I am not going to watch someone disrespect him like that, he said with a threatening edge to his tone. Understandable, I could respect that. But you must also understand that 20 years in prison has not been a good way to earn money. I had absolutely no money on me right now. I have nothing on me right now but I promise I will pay when I come here next time, I said and swiftly maneuvered myself to pass him but he managed to grab me. He is trained in Kung Fu. That wouldn't do, he said and blew steam from his nostrils. In this situation, if you look at it from a moral perspective, they were in the right while I was in the wrong. But in this world, might makes it right. That means I am always right. Get your hand off me, I said and grabbed his hand. My claws sank into his flesh and he let out a scream before I twisted his whole body and slammed him to the ground. You! The other immediately rushed at me as a deep growl rolled off my throat. At least I wouldn't kill them. The owner of the tavern hid in the corner while trembling. His eyes reflected fear and his curled up body reflected his helplessness. Mr. Chun, like I said, I will pay for everything next time, I said and wiped away the blood on my face. The interior of the tavern which was lively and hospitable not too long ago was reduced into a broken room that spoke of the conflict and violence that took place. All of the customers lay with broken bones and bloody bodies but all of them were still breathing out of mercy. Except for the buffalo guy who stopped me. His condition was unknown. On the other hand, my breathing was not even haggard and my body was clear of even the smallest scratch. Oh and put the tab under the name. I said as I exited the tavern, Tai Lung, I got on all four limbs as I sprinted away from the tavern and continued my journey. The wind rushed against my fur as I ran at a speed that should be a blur to the normal eye. I ran past the different obstacles that came my way with ease. For weeks, in four weeks I would be home. Tai Lung's POV. The world around me was a blur as I was moving through the plains at a speed far surpassing that of what should be possible. I ran on all fours and my limbs spent more time in the air than in contact with the ground. I was almost hovering above the ground as my body cut through the air. The wind crashed on my fur due to the speed I was going. My head was held low to avoid the wind blowing in my eyes. It was amazing, it was freeing and it was proof of the supernatural feats that I was now capable of. Yet running on all four was foreign, both because of my other life as a human and my imprisonment. I ran and ran and ran through the different environments and lands. I ran through forests, plains, grasslands and hills. My stamina seemed to be infinite as I was unable to tire no matter how long or fast I was running. My body was trained to endure harder activities for days so the mere action of running was of no strain to my body. In fact, it was quite an enjoyable and calming activity. The sun was at the highest point in the sky and I was running up a particularly tall mountain. I came across travelers and other people as I was on my journey but I paid them no mind and rushed past them in a blur of speed. When I reached the top of the mountain, my speed slowed down as I took in the sight of my surroundings. I satisfied my warrior's instinct and paranoia and scanned the surroundings. My ears perked up to listen to the faintest sounds, the rustling of leaves, the sound of the small stream rushing down the mountain, and the gentle whisper of the breeze. My nose, one of my greatest senses went to work as I took in the scent of the soil, the warm smell of the sunlight, the smell of the trees and the scent of everything else in a three-mile radius which was carried by the wind. These keen senses I now possess were especially pronounced and remarkable to me as a former human. It was incredible how many colors and perspectives exist in the world. It was the same world, but depending on your senses, 
how you view it can differ greatly. Reality really was simply bound by our individual knowledge and awareness. One's reality was another's fantasy. I finally came to a stop when I was at the very peak of the mountain and stood up to my full height which was a staggering 6 feet 8 inches feet. My tall frame was filled with rugged fur which had muscles sculpted by hardships and training. My lower jaw was big and my lower canines were peeking out, displaying their sharpness to the world. My upper body was bigger than my lower body and my huge arms reached my knees. I also had a giant tail behind which was remarkably long compared to other felines. It was an important factor in my physical performance as it helped me have impeccable balance even when I scaled impossible landscapes. Hiya, let's take a break here. I said out loud even though there was no one present. There was actually a reason why I was talking out loud like this even though I was all alone. My voice. I said in a slow slur and with a smile on my face. My voice was deep yet it carried an elegant and wise tone to its vibration. It was soothing and it reminded me of a cup of rich black coffee. It came with an unhurried tone yet it left an everlasting sensation. I had the voice of Lon Makshon. How could I possibly remain silent? It would be a crime to rob the world of the sound of my voice. I said and chuckled to myself. I gazed at the mesmerizing landscape of China and took in all of its beauty. The wind was a soothing melody as I dived into thought. How long has it been since I awakened in this world? It matters not as much as the impossible fact that I did awaken. At first, it was confusing and scary, even for a seasoned warrior like me. Two souls melding to become one. Two lives trying to exist in one soul. And two set of different memories working to build up a new character, a new personality. The existential crises that follow did not help the matter. But the infinite silence of Chorgam prison gave me more than enough time to figure myself out. And I did. I struck a middle ground between my two identities. Tai Lung, the adopted son of Shurfu, the first to master the Thousand Scroll of Kung Fu and a fierce warrior turned bad. I was the first villain in the movie of Kung Fu Panda. A stepping stone for the dragon warrior Pa. And then there was my other self. Tai Lung. A human born in a modern world where the current world I was living in was nothing but fiction. He was a prodigious martial artist who had learned everything there was to know about the art of combat. With mastery over different kung fu and martial arts, he was a young man of 24 who was about to bring change to the world. He had dreams and ambitions but death claimed him too soon. Who am I? That was the question I had asked myself countless times. The answer was rather simple. I was both of them and neither of them at the same time. I think Po went through something similar in the third movie? I hummed, trying to recall my memory of the movies. How does it go again? Am I the son of a panda, son of a goose? A student? A teacher? Turns out I am all of them. I am the dragon warrior, I said and repeated the lines in the movie out loud because as I said, I love my voice. Ah! I remember how epic it was when I first watched the movie. I almost feel bad for the absolute trashing I plan to give him in the future, I said with a hum. Now that brought us to another topic, the movies. Or should I say my knowledge of the future? There were countless adversaries pefaced as the dragon warrior. Lord Shin and his weapons, the shape-shifting chameleon, and there was the final villain I feel pebeat by pure luck, Kai. Here's the thing, I was in no way going to leave these threats to the dragon warrior or the so-called will of the universe and fate. My very existence has altered fate now and it would be evident when Po would be unable to defeat me since I was me now. It was entirely up to me to deal with these threats and enemies. How fortunate, I said. My dreams in both lives were left unaccomplished. I was unable to become the dragon warrior and I was unable to achieve my ambition of changing the world with Kung Fu. But I had a new dream, a new path that I have chosen for myself when I struck a middle ground to my identities. It could be said that this ambition was what tied my whole being together. It was what made my two existence morph into one again. The strongest, I declared to the world and there was a change in the wind. The world listened. The path towards power was a road almost all of the villains in Kung Fu had taken. It includes Kai, Jin Diao, and even Shun who went after power in his own way. Yet all of them failed. In the end, they were defeated by pacifists who wanted nothing but peace and balance in the world. The universe gave power to those who did not desire it. The examples were Pu and Master Ugwe. These two were never interested in power, yet the world bestowed upon them the greatest power. They held untold strength even though they were not willing to go to the extreme like all those who failed before them. In order to protect, they gained strength. Yeah right, how convenient. It was not even them, it was fate or should I say plot armor. The universe was in their favor because they were good and they were the chosen ones. 
I am going to reject that. I am going to reject fate and the universe itself and become the strongest, surpassing even the likes of Ugwe. I do not need to be good. I do not need to be chosen. I was fated to be defeated and become a stepping stone for the dragon warrior, but I am not going to play along with the whims of the universe. I am going to become strongest and leave a permanent mark in this world. I said as I saw the sky darken. The once clear sky and perfect weather took a dark turn as gigantic black clouds rolled around in the sky and rumbled. The wind picked up speed and became violent as it foretold a storm. I look towards the sky and observe in silence how the world react to my declaration. To my defiance to the fate it had set on stone. What? You don't like that? Ha 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 ha. I said and laughed madly as the world rumbled. The sky had become dark and even though it was noon, the world experienced night. There was a flash of light and the sky thundered. Then there was a downpour. The heavy rain descended from the sky and took the world by surprise. There was no starting of the rain like it normally would. It simply rained heavily from the start. It was almost unnatural how quickly the weather shifted. From calm and soothing to angry and bothered. As hinted many times in the movie, there really was such a thing as the universe's will, and it had plans. Plans which I just rejected and rebelled against. A popular quote and the one of the main theme in the Kung Fu Panda movies came to mind. There are no accidents. It was a saying that hinted at how everything happened for a reason. There are no meaningless events in the universe. They are all linked and interconnected by fate. Except me, of course. I was an anomaly to the fate of this universe. A factor beyond its plan. The wind. Once again picked up pace. Brewing a storm quite unlike this world has ever seen before. The trees around me bent and fell to the will of the world yet I stood still and upright. The sky rumbled and lightning struck me. I put up my hand to block the lighting and a searing pain assaulted me as the lighting surged through my body. But that was the extent of it. Weirdly enough, my body was able to absorb the lighting as it disappeared inside my body before dispersing beneath my feet. A sizzle of lighting crackled around my fur as the ground under me cracked under my weight. I stood still and remained unfazed. Surprise, surprise, the old tortoise was wrong. There are accidents. Third POV Master Crane, Viper, Monkey and Mantis were inside Poe's room as they gave company to the dragon warrior who was injured after the torturous training Shurfu put him through in hopes that he would give up. Pu had multiple acupuncture pins inserted on his back, a work of their medical specialist Master Mantis. Viper was in front, displaying a diagram which Mantis used as a reference while he searched for Poe's nerve points amongst fats and fur. The other masters were sitting on the side, watching Poe wince again and again as new pins were inserted inside his body. They were having small talks and just enjoying the moment after a long day of training. According to legend, there was actually a time when Shurfu used to smile. Viper said with a smirk on her face and just like she expected, Poe's interest was piqued. No way, Pa said in a voice of disbelief. Yes way, not just smile. They said his laughter used to echo through the halls of the Jade Palace. Monkey added dramatically. But that was before. Viper said, but she hesitated. Before what? Pa leaned forward to not miss her next words. But then, the door to his room was slammed open. Before Tai Lung, said Tigress, spooking all of the King Fu masters and Pa himself. She walked inside the room and she brought along with her a certain presence. It was similar to Master Shurfu's, strict and stern, almost cold. Ah yeah, we are not exactly supposed to talk about that. Crane said with a gulp now that Tigris was here. Well, if he is going to stay here he should know. Tigris argued which got a nod from Monkey. Fair enough. Ah uh, you. I love the story. Mantis said from Poe's shoulder before stabbing him with a pin again. Causing Purr to wince once more. Guys, guys, I know Tai Lung. Pa said. Excited to show off his extensive knowledge of Kung Fu. He was a student. The first ever to master the thousand scrolls of Kung Fu. Pa started but as Tigris approached him menacingly, his voice grew softer and softer. And then he turned bad. Now he's in jail, I don't know. Pa whispered under Tigris's intense gaze before he grew quiet. Tigris looked directly into Po's eyes, and then she continued the story from where Pa left off. He wasn't just a student. Shurfu found him outside the Jade Palace as a cub and raised as his son. She said in a heavy voice that showed the weight of her words. Master Shurfu? The strict and stern master raising someone lovingly as his son? It made them pause and put effort into imagining that scene. When the boy showed talent in Kung Fu, Shurfu saw endless potential in him. He trained him, he believed in him, and he told the boy that he was destined for greatness. 
Shurfu was convinced that the boy would grow to be the legendary warrior foretold by Master Ugwe, the Dragon Warrior. He named him Tai Lung, meaning the Great Dragon. Through every lesson taught, every technique passed on, Shurfu molded Tai Lung into someone who craves excellence, knowledge and power with the promise to seize a destiny he would be unable to obtain. There was a silence in the room as everyone was absorbed in the story. Even the Furious Five who had already heard of the story couldn't help themselves from getting immersed in the story. Tigris continued, Tai Lung was not interested in fame, wealth, or taking over China with his prowess. Everything he did was to make his father proud. He trained with such intensity his bones cracked, but such training was not enough to wear him down. He always wanted more. Tai Lung lost his mind in the art of Kung Fu. It got to the point that he no longer attaches value to himself but to his skills and achievements. He learned every Kung Fu style from generation to generation, including unique styles and even battle tactics. He mastered weapons, raging from the smallest dagger to the longest spear. Be it spiritual, mental, or physical, he had mastered all of the wisdom under the sun. Tigris continued her story and at this point, Po's eyes were shining in admiration and respect for Tai Lung. He traveled across China and defeated every master he could find. In his pursuit of perfection, he had risen to the very top of the Kung Fu world, surpassing the likes of his father and only below the creator of Kung Fu himself. He grew arrogant and prideful of his achievement. Without even realizing it, he failed to create self-worth and only put value into his skills and power. That leads him to develop a dark obsession towards Kung Fu, which Shurfu, with his love for him, failed to notice. It was never enough for Tai Lung, he wanted the Dragon Scroll. But Master Ugwe saw the dark obsession in his heart and refused. Outraged, Tai Lung laid waste to the Valley of Peace, Tigris said and pagulped. Viper was quick to add her part before the silence stretched too long. The way he laid waste to the valley was also especially unique. He started from the beginning of the village and destroyed the houses but in an unhurried manner. He destroyed a few houses every day and declared war against the Valley of Peace. Pu became confused when he heard this, but why would he do that? It was proof. Tigris answered, the Jade Palace sent out letters for help from different masters across China. Yet none was brave enough to face the wrath of Tai Lung and help never came. It was a testament to the fact that there was no mortal in this world except Ugwe who could defeat him. She said, it was proof that he was unstoppable. So it's like a message to Ugwe, no one can stop me. Who else could be worthy to be the dragon warrior except me? Something like that. Monkey asked to which Tigris nodded. Finally, without any response or change in decision from Ugwe, Tai Lung destroyed the village and broke into the Jade Palace in hopes of stealing the Dragon Scroll. Master Shurfu could not bring himself to destroy his creation or harm his son. In the end, it was Ugwe who finally put a stop to Tai Lung's ambition. Tigris finished her story. And what happens after that? Pa asked and his question was answered by Viper. He was locked away in Chorgom prison. It was a prison made solely for the pup pose of keeping him. Carved right out of a mountain with one exit and entrance. At the heart of the cave, Tai Lung is trapped in a turtle shell that prevents him from even breathing freely, and it is guarded by a thousand elite soldiers of rhinos. One of the greatest warriors in the history of China was locked away. Forever. Weyo! Pa said, eyes shining with pure awesomeness. I think I just peed a little. And there is the story of Tai Lung. Shurfu loved Tai Lung like he had never loved before or since. That's why he no longer smiles. Tigris put an end to the conversation with the depressing words. It was sad. Especially for her who had seen Shurfu like her own father. You really know a lot about Tai Lung, huh? Pa commented, to which Tigris gave him a glare. Pa flinched back. Yes, I read the records. Even though Tai Lung was a bad person, he was a once-in-a-generation genius. I used his notes and his leopard style as a reference to create my tiger-style kung fu, she said. Awesome. Tigris finally revealed a smile which she quickly erased as she said, Enough about stories. It's time for bed. We have much more training to do tomorrow. All right. Noted. The Furious Five said before slowly leaving Poe's room to sleep in their own room. Good night, Pa. Viper said. Good night. After every one of them left, Pa lay on his front since there were still acupuncture pins on his back. He thought about the story of Tai Lung as he slowly drifted off to sleep. In another part of the Jade Palace, Shurfu could be seen running up the steps which lead to the Peach Tree of Heavenly Wisdom. He had just received news about Tai Lung's escape from the messenger duck he sent to Chorgom Prison. Master! 
Master! He said in a hurried manner and stopped when he reached the peach tree. His master, Ugwe, was standing at the edge of a cliff near the tree. Ugwe hummed in response to Shurfu's calling and continued to gaze at the horizon without even looking at him. It's very, very bad news, Shurfu said. Ugwe let out a slow chuckle and finally turned back to look at Shurfu. Ah, Shurfu. There is just news. There is no good news or bad news. Shurfu let out a sigh, Master. Your vision was right. Tai Lung has broken out of prison, and he is on his way. Ugwe paused and his old bones trembled and his eyes opened wide in disbelief. He quickly recollected himself. Indeed, that is bad news. If you do not believe the dragon warrior can defeat him, Ugwe regained his smile at the end of his sentence. Shurfu went silent in disbelief and for a good reason. He was the one who trained Tai Lung and knew how powerful he was. There was no way the panda no everyone beyond Ugwe himself could never stop Tai Lung. Really? The panda? You think the panda is gonna defeat Tai Lung? Shurfu spat out in a tone that shows his disagreement. He is just that. A panda. Shurfu said, still refusing to recognize Pa as the dragon warrior. Careful, you're a panda too. Ugwe quipped with a kind smile. Shurfu held his head, master. He is not the dragon warrior. He wasn't even meant to be there. It was an accident. Ugwe let out a slow laugh. There are no accidents. Shurfu put down his head in defeat. He could never argue with his master with his seemingly infinite wisdom. Even though Shurfu believed that he was right, he also believed in his master and that there might be something he had overlooked. There must be something beyond his current understanding that his master wishes to teach him. You said that already. That's the second time. Shurfu mumbled. Ugwe smiled. Well, that was no accident either. Third time. Shurfu kept count. My old friend. The panda will never fulfill his destiny nor will yours. Until you let go of the illusion of control. Ugwe said. His voice was slow as the wisdom behind his words seemed to drag down the speed. Illusion? Shurfu asked. What followed next was a debate between two old masters, they argued about control and belief. Ugwe said Shurfu was wrong to believe he had control over fate, only the universe controls the fate. He can't control who the dragon warrior would be. Meanwhile, Shurfu argued that there were still certain things they could control. I can control how the fruits fall, and I can control where to plant the seed. Shurfu said and planted a seed near the peach tree to display his point. That is no illusion, master. Ugwe let out a kind smile. Ah yes, but no matter what you do, that seed will grow to be a peach tree. You may wish for an orange or an apple, but you will get a peach. But a peach cannot defeat Tai Lung. Shurfu said, vexed. The peach is a reference to the dragon warrior. Sure, he might not be able to choose who the dragon warrior is, but he knew he wouldn't be able to defeat Tai Lung. But maybe it can. Ugwe said and kneeled down to plant the seed. If you are willing to guide it, to nurture it, to believe in it. How? Teach me how, master, Shurfu said. Look at this small seed, Shurfu. Can you believe that inside this small seed lies a majestic tree which would bear countless fruits like this one? Ugwe said, pointing at the peach tree of heavenly wisdom. A flood starts from a single raindrop. Every masterpiece starts with a single brushstroke. What you see now is not what it can be. You have to believe in it and look ahead. Ugwe said and looked towards the far sky. But then, the sky suddenly lit up and a lighting struck the Valley of Peace. A thunderous rumble followed and shook the world even though the sky was clear of clouds. Ugwe froze in his place and continued staring at the sky with surprised eyes. Master! What was that? Shurfu asked but got no response. Ugwe continued staring at the sky for a long time until he turned towards Shurfu. He wet his dry lips before he said, An accident? What? But I thought you said there were no accidents. Well I did. But I was wrong, Ugwe said and let out a hearty chuckle. I guess you learn new things even at the end of your life. The world is in turmoil and fate is confused. Shurfu. A great storm is approaching. Something which should change the very course of destiny. Ugwe said. What? What should we do, master? Shurfu asked. And Ugwe looked him in the eye. His eyes held the weight of wisdom gained from age and experience. He opened his mouth slowly as if to impart a fraction of the knowledge he held within. I don't know, he said. What? I don't know. Ugwe repeated himself. That is for you to figure out now. I am sorry to leave all of these burdens to you but my time has come. Ugwe handed his staff to Shurfu and moved away. He slowly walked towards the edge of the cliff. The petals of the peach tree came alive and surrounded Ugwe. 
covering more and more of his body as they swirled around him. Shurfu finally realized what was happening and ran towards Ugwe. Master, master, you can't leave me. Ugwe turned towards Shurfu and gave a final smile with his wrinkled face. You just have to believe, Shurfu. An accident just might be what the world needs. Then, under the eyes of his disciple, Ugwe turned into pink petals and the heavens finally claimed his old soul. Shurfu remained rooted in his place for a long time as his final moments with his master played a million times in his mind. Until finally, he accepted the staff and the responsibility his master had entrusted to him. He wiped away the tears which he had shed for his master. Then he stood resolute. I just need to believe, he told himself. Tai Lung's POV Milan City. It was a great city known for its trade and commerce. It was home to different species of animals, ranging from the smallest insects to the biggest elephants. Not only that, but it was remarkably diverse compared to other cities which are inhabited by certain species with similar diet and habitat. The city was one of the main suppliers of everything that is sweet. It was known for its candies, sugar, and honey. But most importantly, it marked the halfway point of my journey towards the Valley of Peace. I had stopped sprinting on all fours when the city came into view. So now, I was currently walking along the dirt road leading to the main gate of the great city. On both sides of the road were lampposts that should light the way during the night. As I said before, the city was a prosperous trading center. Even during the night, travelers and traders come and go through the city. Traveling during the night was especially popular for the nocturnal animals. The grandness of the city could be said to rival that of Gongmen City. There was never a peaceful moment in the bustling outside markets and roads that lead to the metropolis. Except maybe today. Because as I was walking on the road that led to the city, I had not encountered a single living soul. I looked around. The sun was shining brightly in the sky and the clouds were dispersed, revealing the endless expanse of the blue sky. It was a good day. Yet, it's so quiet. I hummed to myself. They must be having a bad day. I continued walking on the road and soon entered the city. It was only when I was inside the city itself that I finally saw other people. The city was quite busy and you could see different animals moving here and there. The streets of the city were filled with small stalls and shops as the owners shouted out what they were selling and the prices. I silently walked through the streets. Decoration lamps hang at our top and connect buildings from buildings. One peculiar thing I also noticed was that wherever I walked, the citizens would look at me warily and do their best to avoid or ignore me. It was not the point that they ran away on sight, but I could see fear in their eyes as they saw me. I guess news spread fast. Although I was running at full speed towards the Valley of Peace and rarely stopped during my journey, it was unavoidable that the news would travel faster than me. In this world, there were birds that could fly and even with all my kung fu, I could not beat them when it came to covering distance. Mountains which took me hours to cross, they could fly over it in a minute. It was slightly annoying that people were scared and making a fuss whenever they saw me. But a part of me was also content that the people still knew to be wary of me even after all this time. They feared me. They know me. Not only that, but they respected me. Maybe not in the traditional sense, but there is a sense of equal dread and awe when you gaze upon the pinnacle of Kung Fu. It was proof of the legacy I have made for myself in this life. It's not enough, though. I want history to remember me till the end of times. I looked around the city and observed the tall buildings erected everywhere. The roads of the city were made of cobble, and the houses were made of different materials which consisted mostly of wood and paper. The design of the city was a replica of the cities during the Tang Dynasty. I did not know what year it was, but I knew I was born in the year 710. I continued taking in the beauty and grandeur of the city. You could already see the distinct and wonderful architecture China would be known for around the world. The color red was everywhere and it was the color in which most buildings were painted. This was because the color red was associated with life energy and blessing from the sun. I continued walking while also trying to remember which road to follow. At last, I was able to reach the place I was searching for, a restaurant. It was not a tavern this time because I wanted decent food. It was the most popular restaurant in the city. Furthermore, it was very different from the last time I had been here. The establishment was bigger and way more luxurious than before. The possible customers who were gathering at the entrance and forming a line dispersed as they made way for me. I smiled seeing the convenience and directly head to the door, but I was stopped by two gorillas. We don't want trouble, master. The gorilla said, please, there is another establishment down the road a stone's throw away. You should go there as I can't let you in here. I looked at the guard in the eyes. I did not show aggressiveness as he was very respectful when speaking to me. 
although what he said was absolutely disrespectful. I have traveled for days without food. I am hungry. I promise I will not cause you any inconvenience, I said with a measured tone. News travels fast. We know what you did in the tavern of the rice village. So please, leave us, the gorilla asked again. I took out a sack of coins and showed it to them. I have money this time, I said and jingled it. It was the money I took from some mountain bandits I encountered on my journey. The gorilla stayed silent for a while, before finally saying, I will not ask again. I let out a sigh very well. I put the sack of coins back on my waist and turned around. But before taking a step to leave, I remembered something. Oh right, I am not supposed to be nice. A chuckle left me. The chuckle slowly died down and turned into a growl that vibrated from the depths of my lungs. I am supposed to be the villain. Then with a speed beyond the giant gorilla could keep up with, I blurred towards him. I hit him with a palm strike that sent him flying away like a giant doll. His humongous frame crashed into the door of the restaurant to make an entrance. Asterisk crash. Asterisk the other gorilla beat his chest and was about to attack. But he made the wrong time to look intimidating as while he beat at his chest. I hit him straight on his jaw. His jaw popped out with a crack sound as his eyes turned white. His brain had been violently rattled, causing his body to shut down completely. I was not done as I quickly changed my posture and follow up with an uppercut. The punch snapped his jaw back into place but at the cost of his teeth being smashed. My movement was a flow of elegance and the tip of my hand display a white trail. His rigid body collapsed on the ground with a thud. His big and proud body that once stood tall to intimidate me, now laid beside my feet. And all it took me was two moves. I stepped over his fallen body and entered the restaurant through the broken entrance. When I finally went in, I was immediately met with the sharp end of spears as the guards of the restaurant attacked me. Have I mentioned that this was the biggest and most popular restaurant in the city? Well, apparently they had many guards worthy of their reputation. Well, I don't mind a quick workout before eating, I said and ducked under the spears before blasting myself forward at the guards. The violent screams and broken furniture occupied the space of the restaurant. The customers ran out of the establishment, fearing for their lives. Bodies fell with each stroke of my limbs as in less than one minute, I cleared out all of the guards. Silence descend upon the halls of the restaurant again. Serve me your best foods and drinks, I said and sat upon the biggest table of the restaurant. I flipped the table and let all of the dishes fall on the ground. Furthermore, I was not going to eat others' leftovers. And hurry up, will you? I said and looked at the goose and monkey who seemed to be a waiter. They ran under my eyes which were glowing an eerie yellow with chi. Thai lungs POV, I'm not a villain, I said with passion, as if I had never said something truer. That is what the universe intended me to be. That is what fate wants me to be. But I wouldn't be a villain, even if it is just despite said fate. I said while eating the delicious dumplings and slurping down the vegetable soup. It was definitely better than the food from the tavern. That place only had good alcohol. Maybe being a vegan wouldn't be all that bad. You know what I mean? I asked and wiped my mouth. The nervous goose waiter took a quick glance towards the bodies of the unconscious guards before looking back at me with a shaky smile. He nodded. I feel like he did not agree with my statement but simply nod because he was scared. That is different. I said pointing at the fallen guards, I mean I didn't kill anyone. Does doing whatever you want make you a villain? Is that all it takes? I am strong. I should at least be entitled to such things without being regarded as a villain. Right? I said to him and he nodded again. I was hungry and they try and deny me food just because of my reputation. That's unfair, right? I said, and he nods. Besides, they knew they could never defeat me, yet they try and fight against me. How is that my fault? When someone stabbed themselves, it's not the knife's fault. It's their choice. I said, and he nods. I frowned. Why do you keep nodding? Are you a chicken? He nods again, but stops midway. Then he shook his head. Anyways, define a villain. I asked while moving on the, the dessert of the meal. Milan City was known for its sweets, so they had amazing desserts. The waiter gulped before answering in an awkward tone. A villain is someone who does something bad. Someone who is evil. Bad? What is bad? I said, two starving tigers fought for food. One of them won so the other perished. So does the winner do something bad? Even though the other tried to do the same thing, does his failure save him from being bad? For example, we all know killing is bad. But what if we kill an evil person who is going to destroy the lives of millions if left alive? Can that be considered doing something bad? 
I said while stuffing my face with the different cake. Is the term bad not definite and instead relies on the intention and situation? Why was my desire to be the dragon warrior judged to be a bad thing by Ugwe? Just because I wanted to be the dragon warrior for the fame and the scroll, my desire was deemed evil and rejected. But for someone else who wanted to be the dragon warrior to protect everyone, his desire would be deemed good. How does that work? Aren't both motivations driven by desire in the end? Does it boil down to why my intention was evil and his was good? So thinking for yourself is bad and thinking for others is good? Does the undeniable fact that I would have done a better job protecting the people not matter at all? I continued yapping and talking about meaningless things as I enjoyed my meal. Maybe being in silence for 20 years had made me crave communication. Or maybe I just liked hearing my voice. My listener, the goose waiter had confused eyes, barely keeping up with what I was saying. But he kept smiling and nodding his head to my words. I knew he didn't understand it, nor does he care but it felt good to just air out my thoughts to someone random. It was a question that has been on my mind since I learned that I was the villain in the world of Kung Fu Panda. In all honesty, I never considered myself to be a villain. I was raised by Shurfu since I was a cub and he instilled in me the moral code and honor of a warrior. That meant I admired heroes and despised villains since I was a child. This was why I wanted to be a hero like the dragon warrior in the first place. But I guess I went wrong when I wanted to be the hero not because I was a hero at heart, but because I loved the idea of being a hero. How could I not? It made me and my father proud. That's why I was a villain in the movies. Not because I was an evil mastermind who wanted to take over the world. Not because I wanted to oppress and kill the innocents. Not because I wanted to steal the chi of everyone in the world. I wanted a destiny which I was falsely promised. A destiny which I worked my entire life for, but turned out to not be mine. I was the villain simply because I went against the hero. Nothing more, nothing less. The world made me to be the villain. And I met my end at the hands of a blessed panda who had been protected by fate and guided by a prophecy all his life. A fat panda who trained kung fu for two weeks made a fool out of me. Then I was banished again. This time to a place I could never escape from. It was punishment. Otai Lung. How dare he aimed for the destiny which was meant for the hero. How dare he tried to be the dragon warrior. That won't happen this time. As I was eating my food and chatting with the waiter, I felt vibrations on the ground. At first, it was distant and soft but it soon grew closer and louder. They were footsteps. I did not pay heed to it even when I felt the footsteps coming closer and closer towards me. I observed how loud the steps were and guess how heavy the person would be. Furthermore, I also cringed internally at the lack of control the person has over his own body weight. Would he even be able to run? I stopped eating when the giant stopped right behind me. His huge body cast a shadow over my body and I could hear his gruff breath. I looked at the shadow and got ready when I saw him raise his hand along with the giant axe he held. I moved to the side. Asterisk fuzz. Asterisk a huge axe barely cut the tips of my fur as it came down on me. I watched as the axe split the table into two. It did not end there as the axe created a wind blade that made a cut on the ground itself. There was no special technique applied to that swing either, it was just raw strength that created the wind blade. Asterisk boom. Asterisk a loud explosion erupted as dust rises. The unconscious guards woke up to the sound and quickly fled from the scene. Strong. Very strong. Master Grizzly. The waiter exclaimed. Everyone leave. I will deal with him. His voice, deep and low, reverberated through the restaurant as every staff and cook remaining also ran away from the restaurant. I finally took a look at the enemy. It was a giant grizzly bear who stood at around 12 feet, nearly twice my height. His body was huge, filled with muscles and the right amount of fat. But the thick armor he wore seemed to be the one that caused his steps to be heavy. He held one axe and one warhammer in both hands. Ah, how can I forget the bear masters living here? I said while scanning him from top to bottom. Although, it was weird why he was attacking me. It's not like I attacked the city. The commotion in the restaurant should be something they should deal with on their own. Especially if there was no killing or stealing. It was not something the guardian of the city should be involved with. It's like the FBI coming to stop you when you have a fight with your neighbor. Do the people see me as that much of a threat? Well, I am flattered. Tai Lung's POV. The bears were permanent residents of Milan City. Due to the easy access the place had to their favorite food, which was honey. The bears had always been one of the strongest animals blessed with unparalleled ferocity and strength from birth. Even without Kung Fu, they were formidable,
but the grizzly clan in particular were known to be great masters of kung fu. They possessed the berserker-style kung fu, which had been passed on from generation to generation. To this day, they remained as the protector of Milan City, just like how the Kung Fu Council protects Gongmen City. It's good to finally meet you again, Tai Lung. The bear clad in heavy armor said to me, as I raised an eyebrow. I went through my memories and tried to think back to my last visit to Milan City. It was back when I traveled throughout China to defeat different Kung Fu masters and learn their techniques. I took a good look at the face of the bear, and the face of another powerful bear warrior appeared in my mind. Lee Ho, I called out. But that can't be right. Lee Ho should be older, and he had scars on his face. Although there was familiarity, the warrior in front of me was too young. No, that was my father, he said. That made sense. I tried to remember if Lee Ho, the leader of the grizzly clan, had any son and indeed, I recalled his son cheering for him when we had our duel. I also remembered the horror on his son's face when I beat him. My name is Wu Bao. I am the current head of the clan, a successor of my father, Master Lee Ho. He said, I will be honest. I have waited a long time to finally meet you and get revenge in my father's name. What? Revenge? What did I even do this time? I remember I was still in my good boy phase when I met the warrior known for his unstoppable strength, Lee Ho of Milan City. So what could I have possibly done that would have made his son seek revenge against me? Wu Bao answered my question. My father had never been the same after his defeat against you. He lost the respect he had, and everyone in the city ridiculed him for losing against a young master. The other masters also talked down to him and my father couldn't live with the shame. So he took his own life when I was 11 years old. He finished his story and glared at me. I gave him a deadpan expression. How was that even my fault? It sounds more like your father's ego was too fragile that he took his own life after a single loss. I said to him, perhaps, but the bears are known for their immense pride. And you broke that pride when you used your nerve attacks and made him lose in the most humiliating way possible. He said, okay, that jogged my memories a bit. I may or may not have boasted about beating the mighty, unstoppable force Li Xiao with but a single finger, which was really the only way to beat him since his hide and muscles were too thick to damage. A nerve attack was the only way to truly beat him and it was during this fight that I perfected the nerve attacks as well. Also, I may or may not have played with him and hit his facial nerves to embarrass him in front of his whole city. Did you know that if you hit the nerves in the pelvis you can make your enemies pee themselves? It was an interesting discovery I made during the fight as well. Although this was accidental. Hmm, thinking back on it, I may be responsible for the death. A little bit. Okay, maybe not a little bit. Just, I am half the reason. Yeah, let's do that. I have bear this grudge and hate towards you for a long time, he said and came close to me. Nice pun though. So, in order to reclaim my father's honor, I want to challenge you to a fight to the death, he said, his mighty stature towering over me. He was even bigger than his father. To the death? I questioned in surprise. Yes, to the death. Only your life would be able to reclaim the honor of my father. A life for a life, he said and bowed a little. And if I fight to take a life, I am ready for the same fate to happen to me, he said and finished. What a respectful and honorable bear he turned out to be. I was surprised and I couldn't help but return the same gesture. Your father raised you well at least. I accept your challenge. I said and the next moment, I ducked under the powerful swing of his hammer. Good. Now, let us fight. He declared, and he finally released all his wrath and the hatred he had towards me. He stood his ground and let out a deafening roar that created a shockwave so strong it managed to make my first stand. Asterisk Ru were. Asterisk he charged at me, and the very foundation of the restaurant shook under his weight. He was extremely slow, but that also made him able to change direction instantly as I moved away from him. To my sense, it felt like a mountain was chasing after me. My instinct told me of the unimaginable strength his body contained. He charged at me, it was slow but he was unstoppable. Finally, my back hit a table and I stopped. Wu Bao swung his hammer down and I barely leaned sideways to dodge. The hammer hit the ground and it cracked like glass under his power. His weapon was planted on the ground so I took that time to kick his hand, making him loose his hold on his weapon. Then with lightning speed movements I used the same technique I used to defeat his father. Nerve attack. My finger met the right target in a scary display of accuracy. But instead of flesh, my finger and claw hit an armor. I paused. Oh, 
He was not kidding when he said he had been preparing his entire life to fight me. When I looked at it, his armor protected almost all the nerve points in his body. Raw or dot. He roared and swung his arm at me. We were too close, so I did not have time to move away. I put my arms up to block and I felt my bones creak under his earth-shattering strength. My body flew away due to the sheer force of his swing. My body crashed into the wall of the restaurant and easily broke through it. I was sent flying outside the street as I flipped in the air and landed on the cobbled road. I continued sliding back until I let out my claws and with yellow sparks caused by the friction of the stone and my claw, I came to a stop. Slowly but surely I stood up to my full height. I cracked my bones and a grin slowly formed on my face. A deep growl instinctively rolled off my throat as I looked towards the restaurant. Ubeo destroyed the wall of the restaurant as his eyes locked with mine. Then he took a step towards me. At first it was slow but soon it gained momentum, and he was full on charging at me again with a warhammer and a war axe in his hand. Asterisk Ruwuaur. Asterisk he let out an earth-shaking roar. As I looked upon the unstoppable force charging at me, I felt no fear. There was a sense of excitement as my blood began boiling. Oh how I missed this feeling. Until now, my opponents have been weaklings in large numbers. I never even got to have a real fight. Now here was the perfect opponent. Wu Bao, who had far surpassed his father in wits and strength. Finally, a decent challenge. The world shall finally witness my kung fu again after 20 years. I flexed my muscles and the ground cracked as I shot towards my opponent like a cannonball. He used his heavy weight to gather momentum. The ground shook with every step he took. On the other hand, I used my speed to gather kinetic energy as I blitzed towards him. My speed only increased the more distance I covered. It was going to be like a crash between a truck and a race car. We met in the middle, covering the same distance since he started first. I ducked under the horizontal swing of his axe. It had so much power that it split the house beside us into two. I ducked and spun while focusing all of the force behind my speed on one of my feet. I kicked him right on his abdomen. There was a rupture in the air as our collision sent a shockwave that destroyed all of the lamps hanging above our head. The ground cried under our weight and it caved in. But even with all of that power, my opponent did not take a single step back. I let out a smile full of disbelief. Asterisk roar. Asterisk he let out a roar and swung his warhammer down on me. I caught his hammer with my two hands, and although I stopped it, his swing was so heavy that it buried my feet in the ground. My eyes glowed yellow and serious as I let out a roar. I pushed the hammer away and stepped on it to plant it on the ground. Then with a leap, I punched him right at his jaw. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe I have lost some of my strength during my imprisonment. Because it was impossible for anyone to look down while I punched their jaw. He resisted my punch and gazed down at me. His eyes were red and full of rage. Damn, the new generations are scary. Bears in general are scary. What are you looking at? I said and grabbed his face before smashing it with my knee. He tried to grab me but I flipped and landed behind him. I hit him right behind his knee, causing him to kneel down on one leg. When his height was finally lowered, and I could perfectly hit his head, I spun to gather force and deliver a hook right at the side of his face. It's impressive he can shrug off my attacks. But what will he do with a hundred of them? Tai Lung's POV my fist connected with the side of his head and he staggered. He put one hand down to gain balance. That's it. I thought to myself as his hide was able to perfectly absorb the impact of my punch. I thought that surely pop his head. He was strong. He was so ridiculously strong that it was concerning. I wonder if my counterpart in the movie ever ran into him. Or was he able to avoid this confrontation since he ran non-stop towards the Valley of Peace. My thoughts were cut off as a shadow loomed over me. Wu Bao had leaped back and his body was falling towards me. That was the weight of an imperial ton falling towards me. No doubt I would be crushed by it if he were to fall on me. So I moved to the side. His huge body fell on the ground, shaking the earth with his sheer weight. I tried to take advantage of his position and leapt at him. Claws extended but he waved his mighty axe and that prompted me to take a step back. Then, in a show of elegance and finesse contradicting his gigantic size, he stood up. He took up both of his weapons and let them clash with a spark. Asterisk Ruwur. Asterisk he let out a mighty roar and I blasted towards him. He was too goddamn loud. I weaved through his heavy, yet slow attacks and punched his jaw. Then I pivoted on my feet to deliver a chi-infused kick to his chin. A shockwave of air and chi exploded out, deafening the ear. That was enough to finally send his body flying in the air. 
His huge body made a hurricane in the atmosphere due to his sheer mass alone. Grizzly bears were known to be able to put on huge mass before they went into hibernation. The grizzly clan masters had found a technique that takes advantage of this ability to build huge muscle all throughout the year. There was no need for hibernation, so the ability they gained to survive at first was used to turn themselves into a living tank, basically. It was a technique passed down from generation to generation. I leaped into the air and appeared above him. With a deep roar, I kicked him down as my chi exploded out to create shockwaves that broke the atmosphere. His body shot down to the ground like a falling star. Asterisk boom. Asterisk I might not be able to overpower him physically, but I knew how to infuse my attacks with chi that multiplied my power beyond what I was capable of. His body crashed and the ground caved in. He made a 10 meter radius in his fall. I shot down from the sky and delivered a hammer kick right on his armor, effectively breaking it. When his bare torso was finally revealed to me, I let out a wicked grin. Then with my fingers I hit his never points. B.O. 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 I stood on his fallen body as my yellow eyes peered down at him. This is the end. You were strong, probably even stronger than Master Rhino. I said, but you fall short when it comes to me. He lay there, nestled in the cracks of the ground and remained unmoving. I scoffed when I saw his white eyes and steaming nose. How pathetic. All that talk, all that hatred, all that rage only to be stopped just like this. His current situation reminded me of a familiar scene which was my possible future. I felt disgust in my throat so I spit on the ground and walked away. I grabbed my wrist and moved it around. Even though I was the one who hit him, it hurts. Stone hide. That was what Lee Ho called his impenetrable skin. Well, as impenetrable as a flesh could be. His son seemed to have the same thing except even stronger. Hitting him felt like hitting metal. Iron hide? Yeah, should probably change the name Stone Hide to Iron Hide. The sound of a mountain standing up made me halt. I took no more steps as I focused on the presence behind me. Hot. My back felt hot. Felt like there was a raging fire behind me. Mountain and fire. A volcano. I looked back to see Wu Bao. His muscles contracted and squirmed under his thick hide. His body was bared of his armor as steam came out from every pore of his skin. I observed him with my yellow eyes, trying to discern what technique was used in front of me. Yet even after a few seconds, nothing came up. I was not aware of such a technique. It seemed to be an advanced technique of their berserker kung fu, but I was not sure. How interesting. I thought I had learned every technique under the sun, but I guess it was inevitable that some new techniques were developed during my imprisonment. A jolt of excitement passed through my body because of such thought. I continued watching him, trying to figure out exactly what was happening in front of me instead of trying to recognize it. The surrounding air flickered and curved, like the trembling air near a fire. His body seemed to be going into overheat as his white eyes shone brighter and brighter. He stood there unmovable as his body entered a new form. The aura and heat grew intense and a red aura surrounded him, shaking the air. Two sets of memories worked like a machine to find out what was going on. Then it clicked in my mind. You are burning your body. Burning your lifespan. I said, maybe Chi as well, but I wouldn't know because I can't see it. But how did you do it? I asked, but the bear was in berserk mode. His mind was too lost to answer me, so I made my own conclusion. A way to burn the calories or the fats and muscles in your body rapidly in exchange for a sudden increase in strength. He was burning his future for a sudden increase of strength in the present. The red aura around him was evaporated blood that steamed out of his pores. After all, sudden increases in energy were bound to produce searing heat. He was overheating Mike Guy's eighth gates and Luffy's second gear come to mind. But who the hell was this bear in front of me? To hold such power and never be mentioned in the movies. I guess the world was vaster than what the movies show. For the first time in our fight, I took a stance. Cool. He sucked in huge amounts of air that it made a mini vortex in his mouth. And then, asterisk roar were wooer. Asterisk the ground vibrated as the dust was cleared by the shockwave. He did not use any wing technique there, it was just pure vibration. Raw strength. The mighty bear got on all four and... Blurred. Asterisk boom. Asterisk the world spun around as I felt gravity abandon me. My vision saw nothing but a blur of colors as I flew across the atmosphere. I spread out my limbs and used my tail to stop myself from spinning. The numbing pain on my forearm was proof that I was hit but also managed to block it. My eyes, designed to lock on prey kilometers away, found my opponent. A behemoth like him was not supposed to move as fast as he did, the world know it, the universe knows it. 
The air screamed and the world resisted, trying to chain him down. But they failed. Asterisk boom. Asterisk each of his steps was an earthquake as I was swung across the city again. I was not allowed to even crash on the ground. My hands numbed. My body shot through houses, destroying them but they were made of brittle wood and paper. They did not hurt me but simply helped me slow down. My claws left a trail on the ground as I slide into a stop. Then I enhanced my body with chi and shot forward. My body became a little bit brighter. Asterisk boom. Asterisk we met and the buildings collapsed. The earth caved in as we pushed each other. I was weaker, but I held experience and skill over him. Then we exchanged blows. The magnificent city became our battlefield as we reduced it to a rubble. The air around him was almost solid, making it hard to even get close to him. His body was so hot that my fist burned when I hit him. We blurred and fought in different parts of the city. He was destructive and I was lethal. I dodged his mindless attacks and fought back with everything I got. I used weapons, knives and furniture. He was hurt, he was cut but he never stopped. He was relentless, like a volcano. My claws tore his hide, but no blood came out. His muscles were so tight and packed that they immediately blocked any wounds and avoid bleeding out. At one point, I started laughing madly. I was fighting the future. He was stronger and faster so I had to predict his moves and act beforehand. I was already dodging his punches before he even took action. Such was the level of the fight. It was a disappearing sight for the citizens. It was not even a fight for them anymore but a calamity. Wu Bao had long forgotten friend from foe. The air screamed, and the land was molded to the image of our battle. It was violent and vicious. Words wouldn't be able to describe the impossible scene of our fight. It was the pinnacle of strength. Once I have attained through years of training, and one Wu Bao attained by sacrificing his future. Houses were split apart, towers were felled, and we collapsed temples. It was baffling and frightening how much power one being could possess in this world. It felt exhilarating, especially the human side of me was high on the battle. The mighty grizzly was strong. It was not my hardest battle, but he was by far the strongest enemy I have faced in my life. But volcanoes do not erupt forever. Soon, the fight came close to an end. The symphony of battle reached its final verse. The mighty bear connected his hands to form a single fist, and he swung it down like a hammer. I put up both my arms as I blocked the attack. It was powerful. It felt like the moon had fallen on me. My arms ached and my instincts screamed my death. Yet my heart was at peace. I have inner peace. Asterisk boom. Asterisk the full weight of the attack was transferred to the ground as it opened up to beg for mercy. The ground was demolished and forever traumatized. He was stronger and more powerful. But power meant nothing when there was no clear mind to direct it. The biggest flaw of this technique was that he lost his mind in the process. His brain likely is unable to even form thoughts as it was busy managing the overworked body. Meanwhile, I was the epitome of calm and intelligence. I utilized all of the techniques I had mastered during my two lifetimes. I was sure not even Ugwe could be able to compete with me with the sheer knowledge of technique I had. Furthermore, I was a technique god. I kicked him right at his solar plexus and a white chi erupted at the point of contact. He slides two meters away from me. He paused. Furthermore, he no longer charged at me. His body was visibly thinner than before, and he looked exhausted. But it was still bloated, so he retained most of his size. The surrounding aura was not as intense anymore, and his steps had lost its earthquake. So that's it, I said and wiped the blood from my mouth. That's your limit. He breathed in and out heavily for a few seconds before he growled. Then the surrounding aura intensified. He exploded out as the surrounding air trembled. This seemed to be his final fight, his last struggle before death. Wu Bao, I will remember your name, I said, but I am no longer interested in prolonging this fight. I have sustained quite an injury, mostly muscle tears, and my chi was running out. I need to end this quickly. The bear seemed angry at my words. He stepped on the ground, causing a tremor. Then he sucked in a huge breath. Asterisk Rurwo. Boom. Asterisk the ground cracked as I shot forward and crashed right onto his chest. Then I pushed in the whole length of my arm inside his opening mouth. His roar got pushed down his throat, and my claws grabbed the soft flesh of his throat. I grabbed it in such a way that he wouldn't be able to bite down on my arm. His hide was too thick and his muscles contracted, so blood could not seep out of him. So I did the next best thing and attacked his soft part. His internals. The one unprotected by the iron hide. There was more than one way to slay a beast. 
The main difference between me and other masters was that while they trained in Kung Fu, I trained in the art of war. Battle tactics, war strategies, army sabotage, ways to kill different beasts, ways to destroy cities, etc. I have learned them all. He hit me on my back and I felt some bones dislocate, but I persisted. I tore the side of his throat with my claw and blood started spilling out. He slammed me on the ground and I let out a pained roar. But I never let go. He struggled fiercely like a dying animal and smashed the surrounding ground. But as the seconds ticked, his actions became weaker and weaker. His violent tantrum slowly turned into a weak protest. As I drowned him in his own blood. Goodbye, young warrior. You died at the hands of Tai Lung. You were honorable, I whispered in his ear. And he stills. Tai Lung's pio a shit. I cursed when I felt his body stills and I could literally feel life leave his body in the form of his chi dissipating. How wasteful. Such talent. Such power. Such a great living being. And now he was no more. I didn't feel good at all. It felt wrong to rob the world of such a soul. I said it before, I was not an evil villain, never was. I did not revel in taking the life of my opponents. But he left me no choice. Even if he were to survive this fight, his life force and body would be destroyed to the point that he would be lucky to live for another month. Yet, I still felt like I did something wrong by killing him. Don't get me wrong. I wouldn't bat an eye or feel this much guilt if it was the death of a normal Kung Fu practitioner or those incompetent soldiers in the Anvil of Heaven. But this person under me was a Kung Fu master, wielding techniques that impressed even the likes of me. He was more valuable than them, and his life was worth that of the whole city. And now he lay dead. For what? To reclaim his father's honor? Because of his traumatic hate for me which he cherished since childhood? How stupid. But then again, it was an honor he died at my hands. What better way to go than from fighting Tai Lung himself? I pulled out my bloody arm from his limp maw and his body fell on the ground with a thud. His corpse was constantly shirking in size and smoke dissipated from his body. This went on until his body shriveled up into a small corpse. A hollow vessel that used to host a powerful soul. Again, how unfortunate. I moved my eyes from his body and scanned the surroundings. The broken buildings and the traumatized lands filled my view. The once glorious city was almost razed to the ground. The urban city was so tightly packed that one building caused the destruction of many others. The sun was still up in the sky but its bright light was slowly shadowed by the dark clouds. A storm was coming, and from the black clouds it would be quite the storm. The chilly wind brushed against my fur and that forced my attention to my body. It hurts. I had no serious injuries but I did not come out of the battle unscathed. My forearms hurt from continuously blocking swings that could shatter mountains. My paws hurt due to the overexertion of my claws. My ribs and back were aching due to the constant ragdolling. Definitely gonna feel worse in the morning, I said with a sigh. Tomorrow never come. I walked away from the corpse of my opponent and made my way to the gate of the city. The citizens of the city were too afraid to even show themselves in my line of sight as they all hid from me. I wondered if anyone died during our fight. The buildings in Milan City were made from wood and paper precisely because the Grizzly were known for their berserk kung fu, which can cause lots of collateral damage. It is made of light materials to not hurt civilians even if they fell. And if Wu Bao had come to me, knowing for sure we were going to fight and he might need to use such a dangerous technique, he should have the intelligence to tell people to evacuate first before coming to me. Nevertheless, it was not my responsibility. The responsibility falls on Wu Bao as the sworn protector of the city. But instead of protecting them, he risked their lives for his revenge. Their deaths, if there are any, were entirely in his hands. It was his sin to bear. That's how it works here, in this world. So I pushed the bubbling guilt that came from my experience in another world. I looked at the citizens hiding between the rubble and said, It was a duel. He asked for it. He threw the first attack. And he was the one who went on a mindless rampage. I tried to explain myself and when I saw them cower even lower, I just sighed. Forget it. Let it be known that Tai Lung destroyed the city of Milan and killed the master in cold blood. Freaking fantastic. My reputation couldn't get lower anyways. I picked up a jar of honey from a broken shop and left the city. This fight would surely slow down my journey. But not by much. This was but one obstacle in my journey towards home. Third POV. Tai Lung went into Milan City. His wrath and hatred had consumed him and he couldn't help himself anymore. But he was only halfway to the Valley of Peace. So he needed a target. A victim he could direct his anger to. A traveling crane said to the audience of the tavern who listened in rapt attention. He went into the city with malicious intent. 
The warm welcome of the city was but an annoyance to him. His cold eyes flashed in madness chained for twenty years. He started wreaking havoc on the city, he said and the audience gasped in horror. They imagined the scene in their head and couldn't help but feel a chill down their spine. How could someone be so ruthless as to destroy people's lives just because of anger and thirst for revenge? Master Wu Bao, the mighty bear and the leader of the grizzly clan, fought against Tai Lung. Their battle shook the city and made the heavens themselves silent. Master Bear fought with honor and valor against the evil that was Tat Lung. His father's honor rang in his heart, and the desire to protect became his strength. But the enemy proved to be too powerful. Even after years of imprisonment, Tai Lung, who practiced his evil martial arts, only became stronger. But Master Bear never gave up. He fought with every inch of his body. The body the people found was said to be only bones. That was how hard he fought to protect his people. Until his body was reduced to mere bones. The crane said, and there were people who cried hearing it. Oh brave Master Wu Bao, how admirable to fight until the very end. In the end, Tai Lung fought not with honor but evil. After failing to penetrate the impenetrable iron hide of Master Wu Bao, Tai Lung stuck his arms down his throat and tore his softer inside. The crane said, imitating the action with his legs. Then at the heart of the city where Master Wu Bao gallantly stood, Tai Ling patiently waited as he drowned the protector of Molim City in his own blood. Silence descended the tavern. But with the final struggle of Master Wu Bao, Tai Lung's wrath was satisfied and his hatred quenched. To give respect to the protector of Milan City, he leaves without taking the life of a single citizen. The crane finished the story. He might have lost the battle but he won the war. His people remained unhurt as he gave his life for them. A small price to pay, he thought in his heart. For even in death he protected the city. The audience cheered loudly, tears falling from their face as they cheered praise and admiration for Master Wu Bao. Although the story told was a bit further from the truth, it was spread fast by travelers and the aerial citizens of Milan City. The story had become increasingly heroic and heart-touching as it spread from person to person. The end was what we heard just now. It was natural for stories to be exaggerated and tweaked when it was passed on. Be it intentional or simply a product of storytellers wanting to captivate their listeners. Ever wondered how the game Cheney's Whisper got its name? Well now you know. How heroic. Master Wu Bao stood his ground until the very end. Viper said to her fellow Furious Five as they all sat at a table in the corner listening to the story. Yeah, and to bypass Master Wu Bao's impenetrable hide like that? Tai Lung is not only skilled in Kung Fu but his mind is evil and will not hesitate to use any means to win. Monkey commented. His style of Kung Fu was unpredictability and using any means to win so he could understand what Tai Lung did on a deeper level. We have to stop him. Tigress suddenly said in a serious voice. Fast. All of them looked at her. Her voice echoed into their heart as they had never heard such a grave and serious tone from Tigris. Even as we speak, he is making his way towards the Valley of Peace, ready to lay waste to the village just because of spite, she said. I wouldn't allow him to do what he did in Malin City to my home, she said and quickly finished the food on the table. The others followed her example and quickly finished their food before continuing their journey. It had been one night since they had decided to stop Tai Lung before he reached the Valley of Peace. They leave with their master's instruction to be stationed at the mountain pass to slow down Tai Lung until the dragon warrior is ready to face him. Now that Ugwe, the main reason they were at ease was gone, they had to take matters into their own hands and stop Tai Lung themselves. They were not going to simply slow down Tai Lung and leave him the safety of the valley to the panda. They ran and traversed the landscape as quickly as they could. Their main goal was to reach the mountain pass before Tai Lung could cross the Thread of Hope, a bridge connecting the northern lands and the west. They would stop or at least hold off the evil known as Tai Lung there. Asterisk roar. Asterisk Tigris let out a roar and quickened her speed. The others try to catch up behind her. She will do it. She will stop him. Even if she has to die while doing it. Tai Lung's POV four weeks have passed since I broke out of my prison and I have traveled across China to reach my final destination. The Valley of Peace. A curious question, why was I so obsessed with going back to the Valley of Peace? There were many other more interesting and pleasant cities all over China, so why even go there if I was not driven by vengeance like OG Tai Lung? Well, other than the obvious answer which was that I had some personal issues to settle and that it was my home, there were other reasons why I was returning to the Valley of Peace. The greatest reason being the Jade Palace and the knowledge within. The Jade Palace was a personal home of Master Ugwe, 
the creator of Kung Fu, surrounded by many other notable places like the Dragon Grotto, the Pool of Sacred Tears, the Peach Tree of Heavenly Wisdom, etc. The Jade Palace was considered a sacred ground for Kung Fu. It was considered to be so sacred that every kingdom and city in China decided that there would never be a conflict in the valley and it would remain a neutral ground. Not only that, all masters of Kung Fu were expected to protect the valley if the peace was ever threatened. It was also customary that whenever someone created a new style of Kung Fu or technique, they should send a copy of it to the Jade Palace. Even if they didn't want to reveal everything, they needed to send the concept and the base of the technique. Although no one was enforcing this custom, it was about honoring the creator of Kung Fu and getting his blessing as they believed in Karam. The fact that the Jade Palace was not under any kingdom and stood neutral also helped this custom to stay alive. That was not to mention the many techniques and wisdom written by Ugwe himself. There was a great collection of knowledge hidden in the library. It was so vast in fact, that Master Shurfu had not even read half of them. I need to go there and soak in all that knowledge. Specifically, knowledge related to mastering Qi although the use of Qi to strengthen one's body and infuse in attacks was not unheard of. The concept of using your Qi to influence the outside world and other living beings was an entirely new concept to me. I knew from the movies that the use of Qi had many uses and could give great power to an individual so I was definitely eager to learn more about it. Those were the big techniques. The pinnacle of the world. I need to master them. I also have many other things I wanted to research and try out. The concept of Qi was also something I learned in my other life although that world had no Qi, there were many ideas around it that I want to put those into practical tests. So I needed to get home, stay in the Valley of Peace which was a neutral ground so no one would bother me, and learn everything I could. Although I could be said to be one of the strongest warrior that ever lived, my future was quite bleak when considering the later villains. They were in a realm I had yet to achieve. Another reason why I wanted to be there was that I wanted to be close to the Dragon Warrior. The Dragon Warrior was the protagonist of the world and as a warrior of destiny, he was sure to attract every single problem and villain to himself. I would need to be present during these troubles, so that I could get stronger and also give a big middle finger to fate by saving the world and proving myself to be superior to the Dragon Warrior in every instance. They will regret not choosing me. It might be a petty goal compared to others but damn it. I stood at the very edge of the mountain as I looked ahead. The sky was brightly lit by the morning sun, casting its warmth to the world. In front of me were the peaks of many mountains. If you look down, you will only see a blanket of thick clouds. They were so thick that the sunlight couldn't penetrate them. The peaks of these rocky mountains were connected by long bridges made of rope and wood. It was the final obstacle. On the other side was the Valley of Peace. I did not run on the bridge, but simply stood at the edge of a mountain and overlooked everything. The sight was breathtaking and otherworldly, in a literal sense. I wonder if my other world was even half as beautiful as this in the same period. Probably not as this world had chi and other fantasy elements. I stood there for well over an hour, basking in the glory and beauty of the world. After that, I went on the last leg of the journey. The thread of hope, or the infinite bridge. That was my final obstacle. The thread of hope was a mile-long rope bridge that connected the cliffs known as the Cliff of Great Awakening. At the end of this bridge was the mountain pass, a great gate that was the entrance to the Valley of Peace. I ran along the rope bridge at a hurried pace but I was not running fast to avoid breaking or damaging the bridge. It took me 10 minutes to cover the mile-long bridge, which was more than a mile since the bridges went zigzag between the peaks of mountains. The distance between the two cliffs was a mile, but the actual journey was more. But when I was about to cross the final bridge, I found them waiting for me on the other side. I couldn't help but smile when I saw them. The Furious Five. They seemed to have been waiting for a while now. They stood at the other side of the bridge, which by the way was still intact. It seemed they wanted to break it when I cross so that I may fall to my death. They must have plans on how to fight against me, given how much longer I took compared to cannon. They must have thought of every advantage they could get if we fought on the bridge. Welp, the first rule of war. Never fight a battle in an environment where your enemy had a chance to familiarize themselves. I slowly walked away from the rope bridge and stood at the edge of the mountain. And then, I let myself fall off the edge in a carefree manner. Tough luck, kiddos, I ain't playing by your rules. The air whipped around me as I fell down faster and faster. I pierced through the thick blanket of clouds and the ground quickly revealed itself. I maneuvered myself in a way I wouldn't hit the side of the rocky mountain, and I fell for almost a minute. When I was close to the ground, I used my claw and stabbed it into the side of the mountain to slow down my descent, Itachi style. 
My momentum diminished by the second until I used my other hand and my two feet to slide down the mountain. I leapt off and landed on the ground with a thud. A small shockwave announced my presence. This is going to be fun. Third POV. Welp, he's dead. Mantis commented as they watched Tai Lung fall off the mountain. Let's go home. Mantis and Crane turned around, ready to leave before Tigris spoke up. No. He is aware of our plan to cut off the bridge while he crosses so he chose to go with the long route. Or maybe he decided to kill himself after seeing us and realizing he couldn't win? Monkey said with a hopeful tone. Mantis snorts. It'd be easier to believe if you said he killed himself after seeing Crane's straw hat. This is Tai Lung we're talking about. He's not afraid of anyone. Hey, what's wrong with my hat? Crane asked. It's stupid. Why do you have a hat when you fly? I need to sit there and prevent it from falling off with the wind every damn time. Mantis rebuked. Well, it's epic okay. Yeah. It'd be pretty epic when it falls off. You're just jealous. You're too small to get a hat. No way you just went there dash guy. Tigris growled. Focus. The two grew quiet as Tigris sighed. She looked over to the side where they had a few arrows and spears which they were planning to use. If Tai Lung tried to cross the bridge, it would leave him with barely any room while he crossed so throwing spears would have been effective. There were also other plans like throwing a net or a little dynamite which they got in from the smithing village. They were waiting nearly a day for Tai Lung to arrive so they made some plans. But all of those were for naught as Tai Lung suddenly decided to change the battleground. Well, not like she didn't expect something like this. Let's go she said and jumped off the cliff as well. The other Furious Five soon followed as Crane let out a sigh. He didn't like carrying all of them, Tat Lung's POV. I scanned my surroundings and my mind instantly started working on how I could turn the environment advantageous to me and disadvantageous to my opponents. The fact that I was aware of the Furious Five and their abilities helped me greatly as I began to imagine the upcoming fight in my mind. The bottom of the cliff was filled with dispersed vegetation and trees. The ground was solid with hints of rocks here and there, making the ground uneven. I'd assume that could be a hindrance to Viper. There were also three boulders in the surroundings, covered in algae. I shot forward, kicked the closet boulder and broke it apart. Boom! I used the momentum to launch myself and destroyed the second and the third boulder as well. The giant rocks, nearly as tall as me, were reduced to smaller rocks as they split everywhere, filling the area. That ought to be more problems for Viper and it would also act as a projectile I could throw at Crane. I didn't like the fact that I could do nothing to him while he flew. The most problematic of the Furious Five were these two. Crane due to his ability to fly and sound technique that could mess with my acute sense of hearing, and Viper due to her lethal venom. The Viper clan were a respected clan due to their poison fong technique. It was said that they were direct descendant of the mighty dragons. The legends go that their venom was distilled from a dragon's fire and was strong enough to bring down 15 gorillas and a mid-sized crocodile. A dumb measurement now that I think about it. The point was that although Viper was not seen using this technique in the movies, nor was her clan mentioned, it was the knowledge I gained from this world. I was sure she possessed it. Could prove to be problematic for me if she bit me. The rest of the Furious Five were easy. Monkey style was unpredictable and utilized everything around him. Like Jackie Chan but he didn't have the necessary power to bring me down. Mantis was strong and fast but equally fragile. Finally, Tigris was just a weaker version of me. I thought over about the coming conflict again, but before I could make further preparations, I heard someone falling towards me. Their intention was to crash on me. I looked up and there she was, leader and the first of the Furious Five. Born with phenomenal strength since birth, her fighting style revolves around directing her natural ferocity to her enemies. Tigris. A grin spread on my face and I got down on all fours before I leapt into the air. The ground beneath me cracked due to the sheer strength at which I propelled up. She put her hands together and directed all of her momentum from falling into her palm. A double palm strike I instantly recognized. She did not even bother to hide her move. The nature of her kung fu became clear. Even if you know my moves, it makes no difference. I am unstoppable. Are you now? hi ya ya I let out a road as I met her attack with my own. An explosion of force shook the atmosphere sending out shockwaves that brought a tremor to the world. Strength was never lacking for the Tigress, yet I matched hers with little to no effort. I was sent falling down to the ground and I landed gracefully. Tigress did flip in the air and crashed into the ground. She quickly got up and assumed a stance. H-A-A, H-A-A, H-A-A. She gasped for air and shook her head. She was clearly stunned and dazed at that single exchange. 
I looked at her with a smile and brought my right hand and blew on it. The bone was rattled and it felt numb. Feisty, I commented, and got a growl in return. So, you're the replacement, I said, my evil smile ever present. I wonder, how does it feel to live in someone's shadow your whole life? Her growling stopped. I felt a sadistic side of me crackle at her change in expression. Always trying your best, but could never quite fill the emptiness someone else left behind. I said, and Tigress looked affected for a moment before her face took a sharp turn. She glared at me in anger. Yes, charge at me in rage. No need to wait for your friends. I will put you down first. Tell me, does Sherfu ever tell you? You did well? I mocked and, like I expected, she charged at me. I knew from the movie that she was quick to anger and that I was a sore topic for her. So I was simply using that to my advantage. She burst into speed and started attacking me. She threw punches which I easily avoided, and I ducked under her kick. Not only that, but she moved with the grace of the wind and the weight of a mountain. Her attacks were violent as they exploded out with raw destructive force, yet they were all controlled and directed. It's quite a sight seeing such ferocity but at the same time, control. I threw a kick while spinning around, and she blocked it with her forearm. A thud was heard as my kick landed. Her knees buckled. Must be the first time she faced someone stronger. I hooked her arm and dragged it down. I instantly filled the opening with a punch. She staggered, and I used the chance to grab her wrist, and my claws sank in. Ah! She screamed, and I pulled her towards me and delivered three consecutive punches at her open body. My attacks were a blur of speed that ended with a burst of force. She growled and got a hold of herself. Her arm twisted and reversed my grip as her hand grabbed me. I could feel the depth of her strength. My bones creaked under the pressure of her grip. No claws though. Strange. She flung me into the air but with grace. I flipped and landed on the ground. I used the momentum and pulled her arm under her legs. She spun around and crashed on her back. With two fingers out, I aimed at her nerve point before stabbing towards her but she rolled out of the way at the last second. I let her go and followed behind her. We exchanged a flurry of attacks, but with each attack, I got more and more accustomed to her style. The difference in skill shows as I hit her and disrupt any attack she set up. Your style, I said, and chopped at her neck. You took inspiration from my leopard style. I punched across her cheek. Furthermore, I laughed, like I said, a cheap copy. She roared and started attacking me with mindless rage. She went berserk as her ferocity lost its purpose, spiraling into mindless violence. I ducked under the arm and swept her off her feet. She was thrown off balance and she fell on her back again. I let out a roar and brought up my leg. Then I landed a hammer kick right at her abdomen. The ground cracked like glass and a crater formed. Asterisk pow. Asterisk asterisk boom. Asterisk the earth rumbled as the sheer weight of my kick modified the solid ground as if it was made of clay. That's one down. I thought to myself as I heard the sound of flapping wings from above. Tigress. They screamed in shock from the sky. Tigress surprised me. She was still able to move. She was extremely durable, I would give her that much. I stepped on her hand and her claws came out. I looked at them and I felt my eyebrow twitch. You copied my style but wouldn't use your claws. Why? Did Sherfu forbid you to not kill your opponents? I asked, and in the end, my voice contained disgust. Young folks really are naive. Mercy is for the strong, I said and with lighting reflex, I tilted my head as Mantis flew right past my head. Heh, I said and did a backflip as Monkey landed on my spot. I continued flipping until I was at a safe distance from them. Are you alright? Tigress, they said and swarmed around her. Freaking naive like I said. Do they really believe their opponent would sit still as they all show concern for their friend? I mean I will since I found it amusing but they shouldn't be doing that. I put my hands on my back and watched them as Monkey helped Tigress up on her feet. She was officially out of the fight, even if she could stand. So, you are Sherfu's new students? I said and touched my whiskers like a wise old man. Can't say I'm impressed, but you guys are decent. Tai Lung. Tigress managed to speak while holding her abdomen. We will not let you bring chaos to the valley again. I laughed. And who's gonna stop me? I hope you don't say it's you. She glared at me. She is fun. Not her. We will stop you. Viper said as she slithered forward. Together. Admirable, but this is not Disney, I thought with an evil smile. Tai Lung's POV Viper turned into a blur as she slithered towards me in a zigzag, slipping between the rocks and rubble. Like I thought, 
they were causing her problems, but not as much as I'd hope. Honestly, I didn't know it was possible to slither that fast. She was like a ribbon, rippling and moving with elegance in the wind. Monkey also ran towards me on all fours like a baboon, while Crane took to the sky with a whip of air. All four of the Furious Five rushed towards me, leaving Tigris in a safe distance. But the first to reach me was Mantis. He was not only fast, but he was also small, making it look like he was ten times as fast as he actually was. But my yellow eyes, designed to see prey from many miles away in the white expanse of snow, locked on his small frame. Due to his small body, he also made a whistling sound whenever he moved fast, which my sensitive ears could never miss. With all those indications, it was almost impossible for me to not sidestep and dodge his tiny kick. I watched from the corner of my eye as he slid on the ground and shot himself at me again, this time at an even greater speed. I bent down and lowered my center of gravity as I moved in a slow yet hurried manner. My movement became a flow as motion became constant yet still, like a flow of water. Viper and Monkey also appeared at my side, their attacks already half executed. I was surrounded from all sides, then I burst into action. I leapt into the air and twisted my body. My body seemed to be suspended in the air as I spun around. I hit Monkey with a kick to the head and grabbed Viper's tail before flinging her towards Mantis. I also dodged the incoming crane, whose beak was like a spear as it planted on the ground. If that were my back, I would have been pierced. My feet hit the ground and I had to move away quickly as in a show of impressive teamwork. The Furious Five collected themselves instantly and launched a counterattack. Viper slithered on Monkey's body and launched herself from his arm, which was pointing towards me. She was like a ballistic missile. I stopped her by grabbing her body before she reached me, but she tightly wrapped herself around my arm. That seemed to be her plan from the start. I did not have time to deal with her, though, as I kicked a rock towards the incoming Mantis, which he easily broke through and landed near my feet. Mantis grabbed my leg and in a show of strength beyond his size, he lifted me up and took away my balance. However, I did not fall as I used my tail to push myself straight up again. Then the fight intensified, the Furious Five worked together like a single entity against me. I used my expertise and superior physique, but they were coming at me too fast and relentlessly. We were constantly moving from one place to another as the ground trembled wherever we took the battle. I used my speed to make a gap between one attack from another. I was constantly moving around the battlefield. If I stayed still, Crane's attack could also be lethal. I did everything I could to fight back, but it was clear that I was always a little behind them. I was barely keeping up. Not only that, but I was outnumbered, outmatched, outstrategized, outmaneuvered. When I blocked one attack, three came my way, and when I attack for defend. I was losing, or so they thought. Truly amusing. I said as Viper wrapped herself tightly around my neck and arm. She was controlling my left arm and tried to force me to punch myself. I opened my mouth and sank my canines into her body. She let out a painful scream. Her body loosened and I tore her off my neck. She was like a ribbon, extremely flexible and elusive. But as I bit down on her body, she panicked and her flow was disturbed. She opened her mouth and showed her fangs. She shot towards my neck, trying to bite me and use her venom but it was for naught. I was always looking out for this. My hand formed a single finger and I attacked the nerve point under her jaw. The attack was lethal as her body froze and became rigid. She was so elusive and flexible that it was hard to accurately hit her nerve points before, but after she launched at me to bite, her instinct took over and she was rid of her kung fu. That was a chance for me to take her out. I did not end there as I hit four more nerve points on her body before she fell to the ground. I heard Monkey shout towards her, Viper, you know, two down. Monkey became enraged as he ran at me. He used his long limbs to try and fight me, but he was devastatingly outmatched. An uppercut to the chin lifted him off the ground as I spun and land a back kick at his abdomen. A shockwave exploded as his body was sent flying away from the place. No more playing around. Mantis was a blur of speed. A living bullet. As he came at me with relentless abandon. He was also the only one who knew about nerve attacks, as he was a doctor and could do acupuncture. My eyes followed him closely as I flipped in the air and did acrobatics to dodge him. After a while, I landed on the ground and stood low, like what a leopard would do before he jumped at his prey. I calmed my beating heart and let out a breath. I closed my eyes, and then I experienced something mystical. The swift sound of the wind came to a halt, replaced by the slow sound of moving air crashing against my body. It was like I entered a different dimension entirely as I felt the previous running time slow down to a crawl. 
I open my eyes, deep yellow and with a light of something mystical. Inner peace. When one is at peace with himself and the universe, one would be able to perceive the world differently. My body stopped any unnecessary process as my brain worked solely towards one purpose, to locate and defeat Mantis. Anything else became irrelevant. My past, my thoughts, my dreams, and my ambition. The world waited for me to make a move as in that serene state of mind and spirit. I harnessed the flow of the universe. Mantis, who was nothing but a green blur of speed before revealed himself to me. He was slow, almost suspended in a moment. I could see every minute detail of him. I perceived the flow of the universe. The world bore its secret to me as I found patterns in everything. As I watched Mantis, I knew what his next actions would be. There was a pattern in his attack which I did not notice before. I moved. Time which had crashed to a stop started breaking free like a broken dam. I moved slowly but with devastating accuracy. As Mantis found himself being stabbed on my finger by his own movement. How I hit the tiny nerve in his tiny body at that blurring speed was a miracle. Only possible by harnessing the flow of the universe. I had achieved an impossible feat. H. How did you dash? I did not let him finish his word as, in a rapid movement, I attacked his nerve and paralyzed him. Three down. I said and looked at Mantis who lay on the ground, rigid like a statue. Monkey came at me with a stick which he used as a staff. I leaned back as the stick swung down without making contact. My muscles twitch and I explode into one attack, quick and ruthless as I hit the nerve located in his abdomen. He let out a monkey scream before he fell down, paralyzed. A Chi Master would be able to see how a blue wave rippled throughout his body from the point of contact. 4. And lastly, I said and looked up to see Crane. He was flapping his wings and looking down at us with a shocked and worried face. It seemed like he didn't have the intention of coming down and ending up like his friends. He must be considering whether it was wiser to fall back and call reinforcement. Well, I thought as I put out my hand and let out my claws. A deep growl vibrated out from my throat on instinct as I aimed towards Monkey, as if I were trying to take his life. And there it is. I could hear him flying down at me, too heroic to take a chance and see his friend die. Though I would prefer if he didn't attack me. He was like the wind, it would prove to be difficult to catch him. I just need him to fly down low enough that I could catch him. I turned around swiftly and picked up the rocks from the ground and tossed one up. Crane stopped on his track pausing his attack and swerved away from the rock which was oddly slow. I swiftly moved away to another location and this time, I threw the rock as fast as I could, hitting the first rock I threw as they burst into tiny pebbles when they crashed behind Crane. Crane turned around to shield his eyes as he looked at what just happened. A habit developed after years of being a curious observer who guided his team from above. He simply couldn't stop himself from looking and finding out what and why I did that. Well, he will soon. I leapt in the air as the ground cracked and I shot up with a loud boom. Crane was around 30 feet in the air and I nearly reached him. But he turned back and had enough time to react as he instantly flew higher. But I was holding another rock, so I threw it at him in close range. The rock smashed his face as he was knocked out and we both fell to the ground. I landed with the ease of a cat and immediately rushed at him. Asterisk boom. Asterisk my hand pushed at his neck as he was trying to move. I pushed him to the ground as it cracked. I looked down at him. He was unable to even breath due to the pressure I put on his neck. Carry your friends and fly back home. Do not try to stop me again, as I wouldn't show mercy twice, I said and pulled away, leaving him to gasp for breath. I looked around and at all of the fallen masters. The Furious Five had been defeated, quite easily might I add, as I was still holding my punches. I saw from a distance, Tigress's helpless look as she had somehow crawled away from the crater. But she was too hurt to join the fight. She must have a hard time even breathing. I walked away from them. Oh, and tell Shurfu to train you in other techniques as well, not just your specialty. All of our were too heavily reliant on each other to complement your strengths. Your team became significantly weaker after one was taken out. I said, the only advice I could give them was to train individual strength. They neglect this because most of the time they moved as teams. But like what happened with Tigris, their heavy hitter, one of them could be taken out even before the fight. The team crumbled the moment one of them is taken out. With Tigris gone, no matter how they fought, they had no attacks strong enough to defeat me. I cracked my neck and stared at the mountain. And then with a roar, I leaped up and started scaling up. My claws gripped the vertical wall as I ran up the mountain. Was it difficult? No, I was a snow leopard. 
Climbing mountains and running on impossible cliffs was my specialty. I was born for this. I have defeated the Furious Five. Now there was nothing to stop me. My laugh echoed as I climbed up the cliff. The Furious Five could only watch with defeated faces. They have failed to protect their home. They lost. Third POV. Come on, push harder, pa. You have the ability and the potential to achieve anything. You just have to believe in yourself, just like I have come to believe in you. Master Shurfu encouraged as Paran around the training ground. On his back was a giant boulder bigger than himself, and this was the 98th time that he had run around the training ground. His endurance seemed to be his weakest point and with warriors like Tai Lung who could fight an entire army for days, it was a weakness he must overcome quickly. It has been three weeks since Master Ugwe's passing, and also the time when he finally accepted Pu as his student. Shurfu himself could not believe he was saying this but Pu was blessed. He was a genius in every sense of the word, quite like nothing he had ever seen before. Pu was not like his other students, it almost seemed like Kung Fu was pre-downloaded in his very being. Although unorthodox, Shurfu just had to find a way to bring that out of him. The prophecy was true, the dragon warrior was a warrior unlike anything the world had ever seen before. In only a few weeks, Pu had become as strong as a member of the Furious Five. Although it was still not enough to beat Tai Lung, Shaifu was hopeful for the future. Pu was not like the other masters, he did not practice one kung fu style for years. Instead, he seemed to be able to come up with moves on the fly and replicate any moves he had seen before or at least replicate their effect, implementing them in his fighting style. His physique too was special. Do not let his fat appearance fool you. His body could take hits better than a muscular buffalo. He was built like a balloon, and Shurfu meant that in every sense of the word. Po's unique body was able to disperse kinetic energy upon contact, reducing the effect of punches and kicks to almost zero. Master Shurfu had even tried to use nerve attacks on him in his preparation to fight Tai Lung, only to realize that it was not working on the panda. A nerve attack which required one to hit a certain point in a body was meaningless to Pu as his body disperses the energy and spread throughout his body, making him experience nothing but a tickle as Pu said, when a nerve attack was used on him. Truly, the panda was the most unorthodox warrior he had ever seen. It was ridiculous. He was sure Tai Lung would have a field day when fighting him as he would try to understand how the panda works. Asterisk boom. Asterisk boing. The panda collapsed on the ground with tongue rolling out of his mouth due to exhaustion. Shurfu was brought out of his reverie as he gazed fondly at Pu, who was slowly becoming his favorite student. It was not only he who was learning but Shurfu as well. He learned new things every time he taught Pu. I'm, I'm done, master. Pu heaved up and down. Now let me die in peace. Now, now, don't die on me just yet. You still have strength training to do. Shurfu said, much to Pu's horror. But before that, a small reward. Shurfu said and took out a bowl of dumplings from behind him. Pu instantly forgot his exhaustion and put his face close to the bowl. No way, Pu said and took a big sniff. It's Mr. Han's. Yes, Shurfu said, indeed, he bought the dumplings from Mr. Han who was renowned as the best dumpling maker in the valley. Can I really take it? You earned it. Enjoy, Shurfu said as Pu took the bowl from him. Pu sat down on the ground and slowly ate the dumplings as if they were treasures. Usually, he could finish them all in an instant but he dared not do that to Mr. Han's dumplings. These gorgeous babies deserve to be tasted properly and to be cherished. Shurfu shook his head and watched fondly as Pe ate his food. On another topic, his thoughts went to his other students whom he had stationed at the mountain pass located in the Cliff of Great Awakening. Their job was to disrupt and slow down Tai Lung while he crossed the bridges of Threads of Hope. If they were successful, they should retreat as quick as possible and bring back the news. He also told them to not get into direct confrontation with Tai Lung as that would not end well for them. The events of Kung Fu Panda 1 have been greatly changed now, since Tai Lung took four weeks instead of two to reach the Valley of Peace. This was one of the changes the Furious Five left with their master's permission. Shurfu looked to the sky and wondered how they were doing. Have they confronted Tai Lung? What if they got into a fight and Tai Lung had already killed them all? Just when he was worrying and deep in thought, a shadow obstructed his view. He focused his eyes and he finally saw Crane carrying his friends through the opposing sun rays. No, he said and quickly climbed down the steps and ran to the middle of the training ground where Crane, carrying his friends, crashed. Shurfu immediately ran up to Crane and he checked him and everyone else of their injuries. Luckily, no one was gravely injured and were still breathing. But there was also something else. These nerve attacks, Shurfu said and he immediately got to work. 
He reversed the nerve attacks done by Tai Lung as the Furious Five slowly regained their mobility. No longer being paralyzed like a statue. He's too strong, Monkey said as he lay tiredly on the ground. And fast, Mantis commented. His techniques were also lethal and ruthless, Viper said as she soothed her injured body which had a clear bite mark on it. Sorry, we lost Master, Crane said sadly, lowering his head. No need to be sorry. It was to be expected. It is already a miracle that he didn't kill you, Shurfu said. Now that begs the question, why did he not kill them and instead let them come back? His first thought was to scare them but he already did that by destroying Milan City and killing Master Bear. Did he look down on them that much? To the point that he thinks it makes no difference if he spared them. That he believed a future conflict with them wouldn't even prove to be an annoyance. Shurfu shook his head. Now is not the time to get lost in thought. Pa! Bring water for them, Shurfu said as Pa, who had been standing behind him, ran inside the Jade Palace to fetch water for the Furious Five. Crane, tell me exactly what happened, he said seriously, starting with, where the hell is Tigris? Tai Lung's POV, how long are you going to follow me? I asked Tigris, who was dragging her body behind me as I walked along the roads of the Valley of Peace. I was already in the valley, there were few villages to cross, and I would reach my destination in a day or so. I can't, I won't let you destroy my home, she said stubbornly while clutching her abdomen as she followed me. Each step she took seemed to hurt her greatly but she persisted. Admirable, but utterly foolish. You have been repeating that for a long time now. Don't you have any other dialogue in you? Or does your character end there? I asked and turned back to look at her. Broken hand, ribs, a bruise on her abdomen, blood near her lips and she was also limping. Overall, she looks like she just fought the most dangerous warrior in China. I don't care what becomes of me. I won't let you dash, destroy your home blah blah blah. I know. You only said that around a thousand times. I said and stopped walking and fully turned towards her. I could just sprint away and leave her alone here, but she would inevitably try to catch up even if she had to crawl all the way and there was a big chance that she could die in the process or run into bandits. Although called the Valley of Peace, it was only peaceful in terms of wars. The valley was a neutral ground so there were no armies of any empires who are stationed here to patrol the place. Therefore, bandits and other crooks made this place their home. It was the duty of the Jade Palace to protect the valley and one of the main jobs of being the Dragon Warrior. Chances are, if she didn't succumb to her wounds, she would pass out and a bandit would come and kill her off. Not only do they bore hatred toward the Furious Five, but there was fame and bounty in killing Tigress of the Furious Five. You should have left with the Bird Kitty, I said, Think about how your lack of better judgment led to your defeat. Although you'd still lose even if you didn't attack me by yourself, you wouldn't lose as hard. Try to learn from it. Tigress growled at my comment, but her eyes told me that she felt guilt and shame. But she was just too stubborn to admit it, especially to her enemy. She is annoying. Should I just leave her to die? Ha! Who am I kidding? I wouldn't be able to bring myself to kill two Kung Fu masters in the span of one week. I was already feeling guilty for having to kill Wu Bao, but to also kill Tigris, who was an important character in the movies and a powerful master. Not only that, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. It was not exactly that I value her life, but I value her kung fu and skills. As a kung fu and martial arts enthusiast, it would be wrong of me to cut down on the future and knowledge of kung fu. I wouldn't bat an eye if it was a normal soldier who attacked me and left them to rot on the side of the road, but Tigris had the knowledge and potential to become someone great. She had the seed of kung fu inside of her, and I value that. I shot towards her and pushed her to the ground. Her eyes widened in shock as her back hit the ground. She roared and tried to bite me but I pushed her head on the ground. Don't move, I said but she didn't listen and struggled with all her might. I gave her a strong bonk on her head and after a pained scream, she put her hand on her head. I used the chance to grab both of her arms and push them on top of her head. I also pinned her legs with my leg and ripped her clothes. Then I was greeted with her toned abdomen and the purple bruise she had on her abs. It was an injury she sustained from my last hammer kick. I hit her the nerves on her abdomen and the acupuncture points to both numb the pain and to also fasten her natural healing. There you go, I said and pulled away from her. That should be enough until we reach the closest village. It should at least give your brain the illusion that you are fine. Tigress moved, and her eyes sparked in surprise as she touched her wound. She stood up and noticed that the pain was significantly lessened. She looked at me quizzically, asking me a silent question but I ignored her and continued walking on the road. Furthermore, 
She stayed rooted in her spot for a long time before she eventually ran behind me, trying to catch up. Tai Lung's POV, why did you do it? Why did you help me? I didn't ask for it. Tigress said as she hit the table of the tavern on which we were eating. I did not pay much attention to her as I ate my food with satisfaction. Two decades rotting in jail made sure you are grateful of everything in life. You didn't have to do anything, she said, and although I did not pay much attention, I think she was referring to the time when I used nerve attacks on her and paralyzed her so that I could properly take care of her injuries and make sure she survived. I mean, what else can I do? She insisted on doing everything herself and tried to wrap her body in bandages with broken hands. She had a false sense of pride, so I had to immobilize her and take care of her wounds. You talk a lot, I said, slurping down on the stew. A simple thank you would suffice. She opened her mouth to speak, but I raised my hand to stop her. Silence prevailed as I swallowed all the food in my mouth. You're welcome. She growled at me and her ears stood up. She looks cute. Not only that, but she reminds me of the orange cat I once had. Sadly, she died after she ate the cake of rat poison which I put under my bed. Not only was she so useless that I was forced to use rat poison to kill the rodents in my house, but she proceeded to eat the poison and also die at the same time. Truly worthy of being an orange cat. What is your goal? What do you want from me? And what do you get by helping me? She asked again for who knows how many times. I don't know. Maybe I want you to bear my future cubs because although snow leopards are called leopards, they are more closely related to tigers than leopards, so you should be able to bear my cubs. I answered in my mind. It was just a flying thought I had. I meant it when I said I wanted to leave a permanent mark in this world. A legacy. And what better way to do that than having powerful children? I could start the Lung Clan or something which would be a powerful clan that would forever dominate the world. I will always be remembered through them and they would forever pray to me, their great ancestor. To do that, I would need plenty of powerful females. There were some feline characters who would be worthy and capable of bearing my cubs in Kung Fu Panda and Tigress was one of them. But it was better to not think that far ahead. I still needed to become the strongest first, starting a powerful clan would just be the cherry on top. You spared my life after our battle, took care of my pain and then my injuries. Not only that, now you are giving me food to eat, saying I need it to heal. What is up with that? You are supposed to be evil. Tigress said in exasperation. This time, her words made me look up at her seriously. She seemed a bit surprised that her words finally seemed to elicit a response. My yellow eyes deeply gazed at her and after a moment, I opened my mouth as if to say something important and to answer her question. But instead I said, Give you food? I am afraid you are mistaken. I said and pointed at her. You're paying for both of us, she deadpanned at me. What? You expect me to take care of you and pay for your food? I asked and she sighed, shaking her head. It's fine. You don't have to answer me and yes, I will pay, she said and she finally dug into her food like me. After that, she finally stopped asking me stupid questions and we ate our food in silence. The people in the tavern were all sitting as far as possible from me and watching us from a distance. I paid no mind to them as I ate my food. I was the first to finish as I started first, and I silently watched Tigress as she ate. The questions she had asked me resounded in my mind. Why are you helping me? You are supposed to be evil. I pondered on the question for a bit. You are my junior, I said all of a sudden, and she stopped eating her food as she looked at me. You are the future of Kung Fu and my fellow student who studied under Master Shurfu, that's why I helped you. I know you hate me because you have always lived in my shadow and you must have heard many bad things about me, but you shouldn't let those be the base of your judgment. I said, people live, I said and paused to let the meaning sink in. They are not puppets in a story whose whole existence is dictated by words. There is no one who is purely evil or purely good. Everyone has their own story, their own motivation on why they do certain things. So next time you want to know if someone is good or evil, do not trust your ears and find out yourself. I said, leaving her to think to herself. You are surprised I am doing all this because you heard I was evil? Well, what if I am not? At least not how the rumors made me out to be. Finished. Now that a few seconds have passed, and I have a chance to think on what I just said, I couldn't help but get embarrassed a little at the wise tone I was using. Was it the effect of kung fu? Why did I sound so sagely? I coughed in my hand to hide my blush. Do you understand, Kitty? Tigress looked me in the eye and after a few moments of hesitation, she nodded. I, I apologize if what I have heard about you caused me to have a biased view on who you are, she said, and don't call me Kitty, she hissed the last part. I scoffed, of course I will call you Kitty. 
That's what you are to me. You are only half my age. I was already traveling around China and kicking every kung fu master's ass when you were a baby, I said. She just gave me a glare. The slit in her I seemed to slice my image in her eyes. Ah, uh, she's surprisingly fun. Third POV, the Dragon Warrior, Master Shurfu and four of the Furious Five were in the pond of the Jade Palace. Shurfu had just given the Dragon Scroll to Poor in hopes that there was a hidden technique or power which would help Poor in defeating Tai Lung. But to their horror and despair, the Dragon Scroll was empty. I I don't understand. Shurfu said in confusion as no matter how much he searched for a hidden clue, there was nothing. The Dragon Scroll was truly blank. There was no infinite power, no special technique or wisdom. It was nothing. That fact shook him to the core. Then what was everything for? Selecting the Dragon Warrior, the prophecies, his dream of training the Dragon Warrior and his, his betrayal and banishment of his own son. All for what? An empty scroll? Nothing? Shurfu quickly shook the thoughts out of his head. No, he couldn't doubt now. There must be something he did not see. Something he could not comprehend. Ugwe wouldn't lie to him like this. There must be something more to it. He just needed to believe. Have faith. We're all gonna die. Mantis held his head and said in panic. Shurfu turned towards his panicked students, who were still traumatized after their fight with Tai Lung. His eyes shifted and landed on Pa, who was standing there with a complicated look. It was something which he had once seen on Tai Lung's face. A face of disbelief. A face someone makes when something that they truly believe in and have faith in turns out to be wrong. Betrayal. No, Shurfu told himself. No one is dying. He said to his students, I will stay here and deal with Tai Lung myself. It has been long overdue that I bear the consequences of my own action. Shurfu said as everyone looked at him in shock. But Master Shurfu, he will kill you? Pa said in a soft voice. If that is the price I must pay for my mistake, then so be it. Shurfu said, but you and everyone else in the Valley of Peace should not bear the consequences of my own mistake. Evacuate the village and protect the villagers from Tai Lung's rage. His students remained in place as they refused to leave him to face Tai Lung alone. Don't you hear me? Do you wish to disobey your master? Go! Da. Shurfu yelled at them, and they all reluctantly took their leave. But took a last look at his master before he too left the Jade Palace. His shoulders slumped in defeat. The dragon warrior? He can't even protect his own master. Who was he kidding? He was just a noodle-making, big fat panda. Tai Lung's POV. Are you sure you are not vengeful? Do you not bear rage or hatred? Tigress asked me as we slowly traversed on the road leading to the village of the Jade Palace. We were extremely close to the Jade Palace, and I didn't expect the scent or landscape to be this familiar after two whole decades. Nothing's changed. I looked towards Tigress, who was walking backwards in front of me. She was looking at my eyes, observing my facial expression as she tried to find something on me. She had grown rather tame in our one and a half day journey, but she was growing restless again now that we were so near to the Jade Palace again. Kitty, I told you my intention is no such thing. I said, the sound of my voice was still as pleasant and deep as before, but there was a hint of annoyance. I just want to make sure. Yes, I am sure you do. But you have to understand that 20 years is a long time for a person to change and for such childish rage to dissipate. I said, the reason I was so rageful in the movie was because I was still harboring hatred towards everyone else. Hatred and anger were like fire and fuel. But this time, I had the experience of another life which gave me a chance to look at things as they were, without rage, without hatred and without ignorance. To be honest, they were not wrong for the things they did. Putting myself in their shoes, I could understand why they did what they did. But they were also definitely not right, either. They were just… mortal. Imperfect. I do not hate them for their imperfection. No one is perfect. And without that hate, my anger slowly died down. Fire could not burn without fuel, after all. That's exactly what I am worried about. You were locked away for 20 years for actions which do not warrant such punishment. She said, oh, was she implying that I am a good person? And she accepted that Ugwe and Shurfu were wrong? How cute. One does not attain inner peace while holding on to the past. I said with a shake of my head, chuckling. Maybe my good side is noticeable with my infamy, but I am not a saint either. I have done things to scar people for life. I said as the image of Wu Bao came into mind. Wu Bao, in a lot of ways, reminded me of my old self. He was filled with hatred and anger that he refused to let go. It got to the point that it became his lifeline, his whole identity. It made him strong, very strong and dangerous, but in the end, it cost him everything. 
He was so blinded by hatred that he forgot his duty to protect the city. If he were to meet his father, would he have been proud of what he did? In the end, to hate someone is to hate yourself. But what about the scroll? She asked. What scroll? The dragon scroll. I blinked. Oh, you mean the empty scroll? What does that mean? She narrowed her eyes. It means that I do not need something special or magical to make me great. I do not need to be a dragon warrior, for I am Tai Lung. That is enough. I declared with a smile. What? No. I mean, what do you mean an empty scroll? Forget about it. You will know in due time. I said, as I could not be bothered to explain the meaning behind that. She should find out soon enough. We continued walking on the road, traversing it uphill, until I stopped to look at the scenery presented before me. Wayo, I said in an almost vulnerable tone as I slowly walked to the highest level and stared down at the village and the great temple at the top of the mountain far away. It was mesmerizing. It was beautiful. It was home, I said, and breathe out. I couldn't help but smile as I looked at the Jade Palace nestled at the top of the mountain. It felt like a long time and just yesterday that I was living in the palace and practiced my kung fu tirelessly. Jeez, it got me emotional and shit. I stared at the scenery for a long time before my focus turned to the village and the villagers who were in the middle of evacuating. Kitty, go and inform them that they can return to the village. I said to Tigris, what about you? What are you going to do? She asked me, and this time not with an accusing tone but with genuine curiosity. The Jade Palace, I said. You are not going to burn it down just to destroy Ugwe's legacy, would you? Ha! Huh. I looked at her like she was stupid. Why would I burn down the palace which houses boundless knowledge of kung fu and generational wisdom just because of spite? Have you not listened to anything I said before? And I was going to destroy Ugwe's legacy by surpassing him. I shook my head. Just go, I said, and she gave me the faintest smile before running towards the village. After she was away from view, I let out a sigh as I felt something build up in my heart. I didn't expect seeing the Jade Palace to emotionally affect me this much. I also felt a lump in my throat at what I was about to do. It's time I finally meet my father after all this time. Or should I say Master Shurfu? K.A. Ching. The sky rumbled and lightning split the sky. It followed by a thunderous crack. An eclectic gale blew around, foretelling an incoming storm. It was early in the morning, right before the crack of dawn. The sun had not risen, but it was already starting to become bright. Yet the dark clouds have snuffed out that small light and turned the infant day into night. Lighting continued flashing amongst the dark clouds as I sprinted towards the Jade Palace, my home. I climbed up the stairs and went through the training grounds, the houses, the markets before I reached the very top of the mountain. In no time, I was standing in front of the entrance gate to the Jade Palace. I took a deep breath and pushed open those giant decorated gates. I looked up and was greeted by another flight of stairs, but this one directly lead to the Jade Palace. That was not all as I saw Shurfu himself standing at the last flight of stairs. He was standing there with arms on his back like a dignified elder. I gazed up at him with an absolute stoic face. My eyes could capture his figure clearly even from afar. When he closed his eyes and when the sky flashed bright, I made my move and with the silence of a feline, I reached him. I stood in front of him as the thunderous rumble shook the sky. Shurfu opened his eyes and I closed my heart. Tai Lung's POV. His face scrunched up to display a stern and serious expression as he opened his eyes. His eyes shook and I could see his emotions bubbling up in their depth. Yet his expression remained hard and stoic. You've aged, Shurfu. I said as I carefully observed his white hair and the wrinkles on his face. It has been twenty years, but his face seemed to age twice that. I can't say the same. You look exactly as you did that day, Shurfu said. His voice was laced with too many emotions and a poorly disguised aloofness. I couldn't figure out what he was feeling. Indeed, whatever Ugwe did to keep me at bay had stopped my body from moving and even aging, I said with a chuckle. Speaking of which, I heard Ugwe had passed. Did you cry for him? Or did you remain stoic like when they took me away? What do you want, Tai Lung? What do you mean, Master? I asked and spread my hand. I am home. This is not your home. And I am not your master, he said in a stern voice, seemingly void of emotion. But that was because he was feeling too much that he didn't know which emotion to respond to. Why would you say that? I know you don't mean it. Really? Is that how it's going to be? I asked. That is how it must be he said and got into a stance. Responsibility and duty. They were chains that held him back from showing his true self. 
Ugwe gave him a huge responsibility on his shoulders, and he had a duty as the master of the Jade Palace. He couldn't even show his true feelings and was wearing a mask. That's how it must be, huh? Don't worry. I will break those chains of yours. Shurfu. I will force your real feelings out. After all, it is the real Shurfu that I wanted to talk to. Not this old red panda bound by duty. Not the master of the Jade Palace. I want to see my father. So be it. I said and took to the sky. A modern snow leopard can jump as high as 20 feet in the air. Now imagine how high I could jump. I spun in the sky and quickly descended like a meteorite with a hammer kick. Shurfu was nimble and had seen my attack coming from miles away. Boom! The steps cracked and were completely demolished under my kick. I stomped on the ground as a huge boulder was forced off the ground. I gave a sidekick and sent the boulder flying towards Shurfu. H-A-A-A! Shurfu yelled and with a chi-infused attack, he broke the boulder ten times his size with a green flash. I knew he was going to do that because behind him was the Jade Palace. Shurfu would rather die than see the Jade Palace destroyed. Therefore, instead of easily dodging with his speed, he decided to break the boulder. I used the rubble as a cover and I suddenly appeared in front of him. I held back most of my strength and launched a kick at him. He managed to block my kick, but the force behind my attack sent him flying inside the Jade Palace. His small body broke the closed door in the process. Boom! Everything I did was to make you proud. I screamed while running on all fours toward him. I punched at him, but he was so fast that he literally disappeared from my eyes and hit me on my abdomen. Furthermore, I took a step back, but no damage. My hide was thick enough to ignore every attack his small body could throw at me. He specializes in speed and knowledge. After all, he was not suited to fight someone like me. Shurfu utilized his insane speed to get behind me and aimed for the back of my neck, but I already anticipated his move. I quickly turned around and grabbed his leg before slamming him on the floor. A web-like crack formed as he gritted his teeth in pain. He was weaker than me and was way out of his prime. Fighting me was suicide. I knew that and he knew even better. Yet you betrayed me. I screamed as I felt real anger briefly bubble up inside me. I let my claws free and swiped at him but he moved away. My claws leave a slashing wound on the marble floor. Shurfu collected his breath and took out a dagger from one of the collection in the Jade Palace. Then we blurred from our position, and we met in a clash of claws and blade. A spark of friction dictated a draw so we moved again only to meet at a different place. I tried my best to keep up with Shurfu's speed, as he used the pillars of the palace as a foothold to shoot from one place to another. We continued our clash as we ended in a draw each time. Not because we were equal in strength, but because both of us were holding back. We did not even aim at each other but at our weapons. Actions speak louder than words, especially for people like us who dedicate ourselves to Kung Fu. His eyes shook when he realized that I was not aggressive. My attacks held no real anger, much less the dark hatred that he was hoping for. He looked at me, his eyes round and pitiful. He showed an opening in his realization, and my trained body took that opening by instinct as I kicked him in his stomach like a football. His small body was sent crashing through the roof as he flew into the dark, thundering sky. I landed on the ground and with a leap that destroyed the marble floor like glass I shot up like a missile. When I reached Shurfu, I slammed him with a powerful punch that synced with the thunder. A huge shockwave silences the sky as Shurfu's small body flew higher. I kicked the air as hard as I could and the shockwave propelled me upwards again. We were both shooing up the sky and when we finally ran out of momentum, I positioned myself above Shurfu and kicked him down from the sky. His body quickly fell from the sky, and he crashed through the roof of the Jade Palace and hit the marble floor. I propelled myself and fell down twice as fast to the Jade Palace. The air whipped around me as I let out a roar and pulled back my arm to deliver the finishing blow. Higher! I yelled as Shurfu lay on the marble floor, closing his eyes and a smile on his face. He accepted his death. Boom! A shockwave shook the entire foundation of the Jade Palace and the shockwave tore the outer part of the pillars. A huge crater of five feet was carved out of the marble floor as my fist was plated firmly right beside Shurfu's head. H-A, H-A, H-A. I caught my breath as he looked up at me. His eyes were that of confusion, and they were shaking. You leave me to rot in jail for twenty years. I accused him as his jaw trembled, too stunned to speak. He had lost his duty as the master of the Jade Palace was fulfilled. So now he allowed his real feelings to show on his face. The once stoic mask made way for raw emotions as his face morphed into that of sadness and regret. I saw my father, 
and he was heartbroken. I, I have always been proud of you, Shurfu said in a heartbreaking voice of whisper. I loved you too much to see what you were becoming. Truly, I am sorry, he said. And as his heavy voice filled the empty space of the Jade Palace, I felt my heart break. No, I don't want your apology. Not for that reason, I said as I looked into his eyes. I allowed my vulnerability to surface but only briefly. You gave up on me, I declared as his eyes went wide. I let the silence help him process my words. After a while, his eyes went wide and his pupils dilated as they gaze upon me. Giant droplets of tears started pouring out of his eyes. He realized. I pulled my hand out of the crater and stood up, tall and powerful as I took a step back. I allowed him to finally look at me after all these years. It was his first time seeing me again. People see what they want to see instead of the real thing sometimes. That was the case for Shaifu who only saw me as a villain and a mistake after what Oogwe told him. But now he finally saw me. He saw not only someone with darkness in his heart, not someone who had gone down the wrong path, and not his mistake. He saw me, Tai Lung, in all that I am. I was more than just a mistake, more than a villain, more than a dark obsession. He saw his son. When Ugwe said he saw darkness in me, I was hoping you'd tell him he was wrong. I thought at least you would take my side and try to save me from whatever it was that Ugwe saw but you did nothing. At this point, I am not angry nor do I hate you for your actions. But your inaction has hurt me to this day. You stopped believing in me the moment Ugwe told you otherwise. Does it ever occur to you that I might just need someone to talk to? Someone to teach me? Someone to show me better? I said as he lowered his head, closing his eyes as tears continued streaming down his cheek. You had no faith in me. You believed everything Ugwe tells you, and you thought I was beyond saving, that you have made a mistake and that's it. Instead of helping me, you abandoned me to a dungeon and let silence and isolation teach me. The reason why that cuts me so deep is because I thought of you as a father, I said, and my voice became a little shaky, losing its firmness. What father gives up on his own son, that was what had hurt me to this day. I was not like how I used to be, I have gained knowledge and wisdom of a different life. I was capable of analyzing the situation as it was, from an outsider's perspective. He was not wrong. But I was also his son as much as I was an outsider. And from a son's perspective, I felt my heart bleed at his betrayal. It was not only my dream but Shurfu's that I become the Dragon Warrior. I wanted to be the Dragon Warrior, the hero who saves the world and a source of pride for my father. And he was always so proud of me, telling me how great I was. He promised me that I was destined to do great things, he pushed me to my limits and I did the same. Yet when Ugwe rejected me, he was not there to console me or explain things to me. As my proud chest fell and my ambition was denied, he did not stay with me and followed Ugwe. It was a dream we both shared. Yet when that was broken, he left me on a sinking ship, abandoning me to make do with the broken pieces of a dissolving dream. I looked at him for guidance and direction when Ugwe named me a villain, but he turned his back on me. It's the end, Tai Lung. It was my mistake. You can't be saved. He never believed in me. My father gave me up for a prophecy. And that kills me. He did not believe Pur to be the dragon warrior since the beginning, but B never gave up and in the end, he was able to change. You believed in Pu. I wanted to say, no, no. Shurfu whispered as he put his head on the ground. Why did you give up on me? Even when I was locked away in the depths of Chakgam prison, I waited for him. My wrath disappeared after the first week of my imprisonment as I waited, waited and waited. Years passed yet he never came. I thought for sure he'd forgotten me. Like a distant dream, a blurry nightmare. I thought, what kind of father forgets his own son? Only after twenty years and meeting him again did I realize the answer. I looked at his fragile body. He was small and had red and white furs. My arms came into view as I looked at both myself and him. The difference was clear. We are nothing alike. I realized, I was not your son. The moment those words left my lips, I felt tears fall down from one eye. I let my feelings go. It was calming. My heart aches. But the end promises rest and respite. I closed my eyes and felt all of the emotions in my heart. I did not reject them nor did I run away. Furthermore, I embraced them and the moment for all it's worth. Somewhere, someway, we went wrong as a father and son. Although I said all of that to him, I knew he was not the only one who had done wrong. I did as well, and what I have now is the product of our actions. A broken son and a broken father. The silence silences. 
that was until Shurfu spoke up. For all his weakness and inaction, he decided to speak up at the last moment. You will always be my son, he said as he slowly stood up and limped towards me. His eyes were sad and wet. From the moment I found you and even to this day, you are my son, he said and looked up at me. A brittle smile made its way on his aged face. I realize now that I was never worthy to be your father. I got a better son than I could ever hope for. He said, perhaps you no longer see me as your father but, for all my worth, you will always be my son. He closed his eyes as tears streamed down his face. Furthermore, he opened his arm for a hug. I am sorry it took me this long but, welcome home. I crouched down and took his hug. I felt that warm embrace made me a little bit better. It heals. We stayed like that for a long time until Shurfu eventually passed out in my arms. All of the stress and worrying about me had made him weary, and our fight and the emotional outburst were the final straw. I gently laid him down on the ground with a smile on my face. I felt a lot lighter than I did coming home. Tai Lung's POV hopefully, that's the end of it. I feel a lot better than I did before, and I was relieved to finally come to terms with whatever issue was between us. I was really not good with these emotional things. I'd rather punch some evil villain or train until my bones cracked. In the end, I had already come to terms with everything and I have accepted myself when I attained inner peace. What happened was simply a manifestation of my emotions. Hopefully, Shurfu find his inner peace too. I did not know if he achieved such a thing in the movies but I could help him this time around. I left the passed out Shurfu lying near the pond in the Jade Palace as I made my way outside. The palace was mostly destroyed and absolutely wrecked, with a giant crater in the middle. That would take some time to fix but it can definitely be restored so I was not worried. I went out of the Jade Palace and stood at the top of the steps as I stretched my body. There really was no place like home as I felt my soul at peace. I looked at the horizon and my eyes took in the magnificence of the clear sky. The dark clouds have dispersed and the storm had retreated, as if to represent the end of the emotional turmoil I was in not too long ago. I stayed like that, enjoying the first rays of the rising sun until my peace was disturbed by the sound of rough breathing. I opened my eyes and looked down at the steps, and I could see a panda crawling up the stairs. He was already halfway the thousand steps, but he still had a long way to go. I couldn't help but crack a smile as I watched him face his greatest adversary in his words. Stairs. It was amusing, to say the least. Ha! Wawaya! He! He breathes heavily, and his needy gasp sounds like a fish trying to breathe in a desert. Hwa! Wapa, Heya. And now he was choking on air. I never knew it was possible to choke on air. So points to the panda for teaching me something new. Hey! Panda! I called out. And he turned his head up as his exhausted eyes looked at me lazily. Seriously? How do you get your eyes tired from climbing up steps? Ah wah! He suddenly realized who I was. And he nearly lost his footing and fell back down to the beginning of the stairs. Luckily, he managed to catch himself. You don't have to hurry. I will wait for you, I said as a giant smile split my face. Furthermore, I gave him a thumbs up, which he returned. Okay. Thank you, sir. He yelled back, waving his hands at me, before he flopped down on the steps like dead meat. I thought for sure that he'd be much better and would even be able to climb the stairs properly considering he had more time to train, but it seemed stairs were his kryptonite, something which he could never overcome. You can do it, dragon warrior. I cheered and laughed while I watched Pa slowly drag himself up the final steps. At last, he was able to bring his body to the top of the stairs, and he immediately laid down, exhausted and with his tongue rolling out. He panted like a dog for a while until, eventually, he stood up. So, you must be Pa. I have heard a lot about you, I said while taking a few steps toward him. Yes, I am, Pa said before he paused. Wait, you've heard about me? Where? I mean, all good things I hope? No? He said the last part unsure and insecure. It was truly amusing seeing him like this, and it made me realize just how much of a character development he went through during the three movies. Who'd have thought that this panda would become one of the most powerful kung fu masters that ever lived, rivaling the likes of Ugwe himself. It was equally amusing and frustrating. Enough about that. I think you have something I want, I said as my eyes narrowed at him. My carefree attitude disappeared in an instant and my face morphed into something cold and serious. Oh, right, Pa said, and he took something from the back of his pants. It was the dragon scroll in all its glory. I decided to not question where he hid that. You want it? Come and WHA. 
He screamed as I moved with lightning speed and punched him, sending his body flying like a rag doll while I stole the scroll from his hand. Boing! His body flew away and fell on the stairs. His body started bouncing like a ball as he fell down, crashing one at a time on the stairs. Did I feel a sick sense of amusement when I saw him fall down on all the steps he climbed so hard? Maybe. Did I also revel in seeing all of his effort going to waste as he found himself at the bottom of the stairs? Just like how all my efforts to be the dragon warrior went to waste? I won't speak until I meet my lawyer. Ah! Ah! Ah ha ha ha! Ooh! Ouch! I watched as Poe fell down the stairs comically until he stopped in the market at the end of the stairs. I looked at the dragon scroll in my hand, and although I knew it was blank, it held an important place in my life. So I decided to keep it. Besides that, no one else in the world other than us knew it was blank, so it could be useful to distract an enemy or use it to trade for something more precious someday. But for now, let's keep those thoughts away, because I have more important things of interest. What the hell was that? I asked myself and looked at the hand with which I punched Po. I knew how to punch, I knew it so well that it was like breathing to me at this point. So I knew my punch landed on the panda. Yet I also knew my punch did not hit him. It was strange. It reminded me of my childhood when I used to hit a certain dummy made of rubber. As I grew, I made it a tradition to destroy a dummy or training material in a way they were meant to be used. It was a show that I have mastered the thing I was training. For example, if it was a wooden dummy made to train kicks, I would destroy it with a powerful kick. And if it was a ball of iron to train my claws, I would cut it with my claws. Yet that dummy was the only thing I could not destroy. Shurfu used to joke that Ugwe made it to train his very first student after he invented Kung Fu. Yet even after a thousand years, it had never required a repair once. Now, how is that related to Poe's body? Why did it remind me if that dummy? There must be some interesting thing about him that makes him tick. He was supposed to be one of the strongest, after all, there must be a reason besides just plot armor. Well, let's find out. I thought with an evil smile as I felt my obsession with Kung Fu begging me to learn everything. I threw the dragon scroll at the roof of the Jade Palace before I cracked my neck and put a huge amount of strength into my legs. Boom! With a loud explosion of force that devastated the ground where I stood before, I shot into the sky. I did a flip to control the trajectory I was falling and aimed right at the market where Poe was standing. I used my limbs to guide me when I started free-falling to the ground. The air rushed past my fur as I enjoyed the feeling of freedom right before landing on the ground. Phew! Boom! I did a superhero landing as the controlled shockwave welcomed me. I stood up and nodded in satisfaction when I saw the admiration on Poe's face. Woohoo! Awesome! He said, almost fanboying before he collected himself. So, Dragon Warrior, let us fight to decide the fate of the valley. If I win, I will destroy all and everything you love. I said to him and I saw his face get serious. Good. And what if you lose? He asked me and I looked at him like an idiot. There is no such thing. Do you accept? I won't let you destroy the valley, Tai Lung. No matter how cool you are, I will protect my home as the Dragon Warrior. He said and got into his famous stance. Good. I said and a savage grin spread my face as I raised my fist. Our battle will be legendary. Tai Lung's POV our battle was not legendary. Hi Ao. W Ho Yu Yu. Boing. Thumb. Po would charge at me time and time again but I simply blocked every attack he threw at me before I launched him to the sky. Flying away. Again and again. Okay tough guy. How a boo at this. Po yelled before charging at me. I sidestepped away as his punch missed and he was leaning too much on the punch that he lost balance. I grabbed his body and took control of his weight. Spinning around I threw him into the air to fall onto the place where he started. Boing! Thumb! I mean, I did not know what exactly I was expecting, but this was just not it. But then again, he had only been training for less than four weeks. In fact, he could be said to be only slightly below a member of the Furious Five. An impressive feat given he only trained for a few weeks. But that was worthless power to me, since I could take all five of them with ease. I should have expected this, I was so much stronger than him. The only way he defeated me in the movie was because instead of fighting him, I was more focused on the scroll. The funny thing was how good he was when it came to fighting for the scroll. The whole training arc he had was related to him and Shurfu fighting over food or one dumpling. And in my art battle, the whole theme was the two of us fighting to obtain the scroll. If you think about it, was it not too convenient that his whole training was related to fighting over something, as if he had known we were going to fight for the scroll beforehand? 
a coincidence? I think not. It was the universe's will. Bullshits. You cannot defeat me, Dragon Warrior. You do not have the power to back up your title. I said and kicked him on his jaw, sending him flying away again. Boing. Thumb. In his defense, he was quick to recover as he quickly got back to his feet and moved around quickly. Or at least that's what he must have thought. But in reality, he was only moving his head around quickly. I wanted to tell him, just because it looks like you are moving fast from your perspective, doesn't mean you are actually fast like Shurfu, but I didn't because he looked stupid. It's funny. He lunged at me. Boing. Thumb. Maybe the dragon warrior at the end of the third movie would be a worthy opponent. Po with inner peace could also be a great opponent to fight against. But the one standing in front of me? He was too young and inexperienced for me. Let's end this. I said with a growl before I shot towards him. I threw a punch, aiming for his head so that I could knock him out, but by pure coincidence he dodged it. Or was it a coincidence? I thought so because of his comical reactions to his own movements. I threw different attacks at him and surprisingly he did well to dodge them. But he still evaded my attacks with a woe we, as if it was by a fluke that he dodged my attacks. Interesting. I thought to myself. Don't tell me the universe favors him so much that it allows him to dodge multiple attacks by pure coincidence. That'd be too op. It was frustrating. I didn't know if he was doing it intentionally. But it was a great way to agitate your opponent and invite them for a reckless move. Then you can take advantage of their opening with a counterattack. I continued attacking him while he blocked and evaded, but after a few seconds, I decided to increase the intensity. Let's do 40% of my strength. I balled my hand into a fist and stand in a linear stance. My attack started from my feet, gathering kinetic energy until I unleashed everything in a one-inch punch. My punch landed on him but similar to last time, I didn't hit him. I watched in rapt attention as the force of my punch slowly traveled up his fat body like a wave, dispersing the damage until it was reduced to nothing. Or not. Under my shocked eyes, the waves of kinetic energy returned slowly and traveled up his arm until Poe's body snapped back at me. I put my arms up and blocked the incoming double punch but I was still sent flying and crashing into a building. Phew. Crash. Wasn't that an interesting little thing? I said with a smile as I walked out of the destroyed building. I think I figured it out now. His body was special, you would think that his fat body was not suited for fighting at all, but you would be wrong. Instead, it was perfect. If this was a Chinese cultivation novel, it would state that Pu had the heavenly rubbery physique or immortal Saint Soul balloon body or something. I thought it was strange that he had no specific style of fighting. Many would consider having no specific Kung Fu to be a great weakness. But that was not the case for Pu, instead it was strength. Every Kung Fu style has a weakness and there are two ways to remove that weakness. You either learn every Kung Fu technique to cover that weakness like me, or you decide to not have a specific Kung Fu altogether like him. We were opposites. Now it became ironically ingenious. Was he full of weakness without a Kung Fu? Well, some might say having everything as your weakness means you have no weakness at all. I used my knowledge of the Kung Fu Panda movies and even other fiction and martial arts knowledge to analyze him seriously. His whole gimmick seemed to be fluidity, the freedom to come up with the best move on the fly. And then there was also the interesting thing about him, which was his body. That's when the fact that he reminded me of the dummy I used to hit in my childhood finally made sense. Poe was also just like that, the harder you hit, the harder it hit back. It was like he was mirroring the power you were using when fighting him. That would go on and on until you went all out and then when he fights back, matching your intensity, you will lose eventually. You truly are one of a kind, I said, pulling him out of his happy moment. He was looking at his own hands as if he did not believe what he just did. Oh really? Then come at me. He said and got into a stance, a wide smile on his face. I lowered my body and started running at him on all fours. I was going to get a little more serious and see if he could really match my power. A roar thundered out from my throat on instinct. And this time, Pa looked extremely serious as he blasted himself at me. In a clash of strength, we locked our forearms and a shockwave cleared our battlefield of sound and pebbles. Then the fight began as my arms became a blur of motion that unleashed a relentless attack at the Dragon Warrior. Pa seemed to have an innate talent for dodging as he weaved through my attacks to launch an attack of his own. He threw a punch and I grabbed his fist before pulling him towards me and landing a hook at his abdomen. A wave of kinetic energy rippled on his body again as I found myself ducking under a punch that was too strong for him to throw. He did it again. His body had the natural ability to contain the kinetic energy and release it in his attack. It was incredible. 
They never go into detail about how things work in the movies or explain their kung fu. But there are interesting things to learn in this world. We started exchanging blows as the fight got more intense. Each of our attacks seemed to grow stronger and more lethal as the fight went on. Snake style, the muscle in my arms relaxed to the extreme until it suddenly burst into motion, becoming a blur as they attacked Po like a snake going for a lethal bite. Black tiger fist. My footwork became a blur and the solid ground acted like waves for me as I float from one place to another. My punches also became like waves as they curved around Po's defense and hit him wherever I wanted. Cho Jiao of Master Sloth. My attacks became a combination as each attack set up for the next. They were stitched together moves that get stronger and stronger the longer it goes uninterrupted. A combination of attacks ends at 4 to 6 moves, but this technique could go on for 3 days if not disturbed. The weakness was obvious, disrupting one attack reset the combination to 0. But it was the first time Po was seeing it, so he could never hope to disrupt the combination. I used this kung fu to see the similarity between it and how Po seemed to be able to mirror the intensity of his opponent's power. Just like that, the fight went on for a while as I used different kung fu on the dragon warrior, testing his strength and finding out his potential. I lowered my body and delivered a powerful back kick to his jaw that sent him flying into the sky. Although I loved playing with him, it's time to end this. I leapt into the air and when I reached him, I executed the perfect hammer kick and sent him flying down to the ground. He crashed on the ground with an explosion of shockwaves that caused an earthquake. His bed made a deep crater. How much force can his body take? I thought to myself as I fell from the sky and descend directly on Pa. Let's see, 50%, I thought, and while holding back half my strength, I slammed a punch at Poe's body. Boom! An explosion, as if a bomb had detonated, shook the whole market and the ground made webs of cracks. A huge crater was revealed when the dust settled, with Poe lying in the center. I stood beside Pa as I watched him grunt in pain, but ultimately he could still stand up on his feet. His body was not durable or hard like Tigris, but his ability to take hits and recover was insane. If Tigris had a high defense, I had a high HP and HP recovery rate. I guess that is to be expected of the Dragon Warrior. I think he healed quite easily even after he was shot point blank with the Cannon of Shin. It took him three days to heal from his near-death injuries. Uhaau, Tai El Lung. I will not let you, he said as he staggered up to his feet. After a few more seconds, he lunged at me with whatever strength he had left. I already learned that his body was resistant to blunt attacks like Luffy, but what about sharp attacks? I thought before stepping back to dodge his punch. Then I let out the claws on my right hand and stabbed it at the side of Poe's abdomen. A part one knew had no vital organs. He instantly stopped as he remained unmoving. My claws sank into his body to draw blood. It must have been the first time he saw his own blood because he seemed shocked. Strange. I thought you'd pop like a balloon, I said with a smile when he looked up at me with wide, round eyes. I pulled out my claws and pushed him away as he staggered back. He fell on his back and when he looked at the blood pouring from the wound, he started panicking. No! No! I don't want to die! He said in a dramatic manner as he started sobbing but without any real tears. Stop the drama. You wouldn't die from just that. It's only around two inches deep, I said with his fat body that was but a scratch. Really? He asked, relieved. Yeah, just make sure to put pressure so you don't bleed to death. I said, and Poe was quick to put pressure on his wound. Then he looked at me with betrayed eyes. The Furious Five should return soon, I said as my ear twitched, listening to them running towards us and the villagers who were just behind. Just tell them you fought bravely and earned my respect. So I no longer bear hatred towards you as the Dragon Warrior or the Jade Palace, I said, turning around and running up the stairs again. I was done for the day. I need a good rest after my long journey. I made a beeline to the student barracks of the Jade Palace. I was home. I was at peace. I need not fear attackers. And it was nice to sleep on a proper bed after so long. So when I reached the room, I instantly fell asleep and slept for the whole day. Third POV, the Furious Five. Pu and Master Shurfu were currently gathered in the pond of the Jade Palace. The once awe-inspiring hall of wonder and majesty was nowhere to be found. Replaced with a wrecked hall, and a devastated floor that hints at the intensity of the fight that took place. It was a broken palace. Master Shurfu was standing at the edge of the pond while turning his back on his student. His eyes were focused on his own reflection in the water as he was deep in thought. The students of Shurfu had just finished helping the villagers settle back into their homes, and they reassured them that they were safe with the lie that the dragon warrior had protected them. It took a long time to calm the villagers but at last, 
when it was evening, they were done. After that, they had all gathered at the Jade Palace and found their master like this. Master, what are we going to do? Viper asked with a hiss of worry. Um, correction, what can we do? Monkey said while folding his arm as they all looked at their master for answers. We can always run away. Mantis commented as everyone else snapped their neck to look at him. Or not, he added. Let's all calm down first and wait for Crane to come back with the news. Tigress said to her fellow students and just as she finished, the sound of flapping wings brought their attention to the entrance. Crane flew inside with rapid breaths and a panicked look on his face. He tumbled on the floor as he could not even execute proper lading due to his panic. It's true, he is sleeping in the student barracks at this very moment. Crane declared, getting the gasp of everyone's in response. Tai Lung of all people was sleeping in their room. What the heck were they supposed to do about that? Whose room was he using? Monkey was quick to ask the important question as everyone looked at Crane for answers. I don't know. What do you expect me to do? Get closer to the dorm and see whose room he was sleeping in? Hell no. I am not going anywhere near that guy. I love my life. Thank you very much. Crane defended his ignorance. The only thing I know is that he was indeed sleeping in one of the rooms. I think you might be overreacting a bit, Crane. Mantis said after he appeared on top of his hat in a blur of speed. Easy for you to say. You were not pushed down and threatened. You were lucky to get taken out early. Crane said, I still remembered it clearly. The dangerous eyes he had when he pushed me against the ground and told me he wouldn't show mercy next time. His body shivered just remembering it. It seemed after his encounter with Tai Lung, Crane, ever soft-hearted, had developed PSTD. He was under the most emotional torture after all seeing all his friends taken out, not knowing if they were alive or not. Yet he was not able to do a damn thing. And then he was taken down from the sky, which he always thought was a safe place for him. The threat Tai Lung gave him was the final nail in the coffin. His eyes. Crane muttered and remembered Tai Lung's bright yellow eyes burning with cruelty and violence. Feels like he was looking at me like food, Crane said. Many people had looked down on him before and even had eyes of disdain for him, Yet none could even come close to how uncomfortable he felt under Tai Lung's gaze. The eyes of a predator looking at his prey. He definitely wanted to eat me. Don't be ridiculous. Tiger scoffed. Why would anyone want to eat you? She said, feeling a bit defensive of Tai Lung. Tai Lung isn't like that. I, I guess. Crane said, although to this day he wondered why Tai Lung muttered, would it be like chicken? Right before letting him go. After that small exchange, Everyone turned back to Master Shurfu who was still deep in thought, looking at the pond. Master! Shurfu finally turned around and looked at his students. He observed them one by one and noticed that Po had a bandage wrapped around the side of his abdomen. Other than that, everyone else was fine. You all did a good job in helping the villagers. You are dismissed for the day, Shurfu said stoically to his students, who were taken aback. But Master, what are we going to do about Dash? You'll do nothing. Shurfu cut them off. The Jade Palace is as much of a home for Tai Lung as it is for all of you. If he wants to stay in the Jade Palace, he can stay. It is his home. Shurfu said with no room for argument but Viper found one. But Tai Lung is a villain. He is a criminal. We can't let him stay here and endanger the valley. Viper voiced out her rejection to the idea. Viper, Tai Lung is not who you think he is. He is not what the rumors made him out to be, Tigress said. She was going to say good, but she realized that Tai Lung may not be evil, but he was not good either, like he said. He was also annoying. He hurts Pa. Viper snapped at Tigress, anger apparent when she said that. Everyone turned to the panda, who was awfully silent as he stood with them. He made a face when he realized everyone was looking at him, and he wiggled around nervously. Um, he started, he seems cool. Although he hurt me, it was during the fight, and it is not that serious. Although Po was afraid of Tai Lung at first due to all the bad rumors and stories about him, he was surprisingly chill. He might be rude and ruthless, but Po definitely felt that he was not a bad person. Everyone nodded, agreeing with his words, as Po was running around with them and helping the villagers even with his so-called injury. But he is still a criminal and a fugitive, what about what he did to Milan City? He killed Master Wu Bao. This time it was Crane who spoke out. He seemed to side with Viper. He though Tai Lung should not be allowed to remain in the Jade Palace. He explained that to me when I asked. It was not an attack but a duel to the death, which both of them accepted. The reason was related to Wu Bao's father, whom Tai Lung defeated, or something. 
and Wu Bao wanted revenge. Tai Lung never attacked the city itself. Tigress came to Tai Lung's defense yet again. And you simply believe that? Viper asked, why are you defending him anyway? What did he do to you while you were with him? It was astounding that Tigress was defending Tai Lung. She used to be the one who hated him the most yet here she was, taking his side. Tigress glared at Viper for her stupid question. She just came to learn that Tai Lung was not evil like the people made him out to be. It was not fair so she wanted to make it right. There was nothing more to it. She was simply doing what she thought was right. Ah, I see. That makes sense. Shurfu said, catching their attention. I do recall about the fight Tai Lung and Lise Ho had. It was the source of gossip around China for a while. Shurfu touched his beard while recalling that event. Li Shou's great reputation was ruined after Tai Lung defeated him with one finger. And his dignity was also destroyed as he peed himself during the fight. In front of thousands of crowds. It was such a dishonor to his name because he was a serious and respected giant bear. The fact that he peed himself was especially humiliating for a person of his stature. He never recovered from that humiliation and killed himself a long time ago. Such a tragedy that was. But Tai Lung could not be blamed because he only mastered the nerve attacks during that fight. So it was not on purpose that Tai Lung humiliated Lise Ho like that. But from Wu Bao's perspective, yes, it seems reasonable that Wu Bao, the son of Lise Ho, would seek revenge against Tai Lung, Shurfu said with a sigh. So, does that mean Tai Lung is living with us now? Mantis asked. Yes, it means just that Mantis, Shurfu said, and no one else had other objection. In the end, Shurfu was the master of the Jade Palace. They had no right or audacity to question him further. And even if I were to decide against it, there is nothing we can do, Shurfu said in a measured tone. Who was going to drive Tai Lung away if he wanted to stay here? The different masters in China who refused to come to their aid when Tai Lung went on a rampage. That should speak volumes of how respected and feared Tai Lung was. It was the duty and honor of every Kung Fu master to give aid to the sacred place of Kung Fu. The home of the inventor of Kung Fu when it faced danger. Yet they would rather abandon their honor than face Tai Lung's rage. However, there was one possibility. If a kingdom decided to get rid of Tai Lung and used all of their troops and masters to attack Tai Lung. But what kind of kingdom or city would waste such resources for a single person? None. So it could be said that Tai Lung was unstoppable. Especially after the passing of Ugwe. There was nothing that could be done. The Furious Five also realized this. What were they going to do? Fight him again? They did not want to do that ever again. But worry not students, I have talked to Tai Lung and settled the issue. He will not hurt any one of you if left unprovoked. You can return to your rooms now, Shurfu said, and with reluctance and helplessness, the Furious Five and Pu left the Jade Palace. Shurfu watched as his students left with a small smile. Then he turned back to the pond, which had now settled while they talked. The water was calm and Shurfu could see his reflection clearly. A failed father. That's what he saw. But the universe had given him a chance to redeem himself. Tai Lung was going to live in the Jade Palace from now on. Maybe, just maybe, he could do better this time. Master, Tigress called and brought Shurfu out of his reverie as he turned to look at her student. May I sleep in the guest room? Shurfu raised his eyebrow. Tai Lung's POV. You know you slept well when you slept in the morning and woke up the next morning. A full 24 hours of sleep. When I first woke up, I thought I had only slept a few minutes instead of a whole day. But the subconscious part of my mind told me that it had been a day. But I still did not get up. I continued closing my eyes as I enjoyed the afterglow of the great sleep. My soul needed that. It wasn't until my ears picked up the sound of footsteps coming inside the barracks that I opened my eyes. I pushed myself up on the bed and stretched my body, which seemed to be full of vigor more than ever. The room was neat and without any decoration or items that held personality. If not for the pleasant scent of the room, I would call this room mundane. Yet, as I took in the smell, I couldn't say I did not like the room. The sound of footsteps stopped in front of the door and paused for a second before it was slid ajar to reveal Tigress. Oh, it's the kitty. Good morning. I said as Tigress looked at me with a cold face. The face of stoicism. You slept in my room. Did I? I asked. I thought it was a free room since it was so mundane. Her stoic face broke as she glared at me. It was a lie we both knew I could tell if a room was used or not just from the smell. But where else was I supposed to sleep? Crane used a mat as a bed since he slept while standing up. Monkey used a hammock that could not support my weight. Mantis was too small and Viper used a log to coil around and sleep. The empty rooms had no beds. 
There was Poe's room which I could have used but between Purr and Tigress, I chose her because we were both felines and the type of bed we wanted to sleep in was similar. I am here to wake you up and invite you to breakfast, she said, and my ears perked up at the word. Breakfast? Food? Count me in. Lead the way. I stood up from the end and followed her as she led me towards the dining place of the barrack. The barracks of the students consisted of three buildings interconnected to make one house. The barracks could hold around ten people and it had a kitchen, dining room, living room, bathroom and everything in between that you could hope for in a house. In fact, the barracks were rather luxurious and big when compared to houses that existed during this era. It was a show of just how influential and wealthy the Jade Palace was. We went to a different section of the house and I looked around at the changes that had taken place while I was away. Be quiet. He'll be here soon. I just don't get it. Why are we going to share a meal with him? What if he decides to stop playing nice all of a sudden? It is master's order. Remember, he told us to be nice and to treat him like one of us. Technically, he is our senior so we should be respectful. Who the hell would disrespect him anyways? What I am worried about is if he would mind me standing on the table. <gasps> Are the noodles ready? Just a sec. I am going to serve Tai Lung. I'm kind of nervous, so don't rush me. I heard the lively chattering at the dining table as we went near it. But the moment Tigress and I stepped in, an absolute silence descended in the room. I stood at the entrance while Tigress went in and took her seat. I watched my juniors in amusement as they wiggled awkwardly in their seat. I slowly brought my hands up and imitate a monster's claw before I said, Boo. Funnily enough, Crane and Monkey still flinched in their seat rather loudly. Really, how badly did I traumatize these kids? Chuckling softly to myself, I took the empty seat which appears to be reserved for me. The Furious Five eyed themselves and me while I got comfortable in my seat. Good morning kids, I said while eyeing everyone on the table. My tone was cold and firm, a contrast to the amusement I felt when I looked at them. Morning, good morning. They wished me back politely but I could see that they were unsure of how to act around me. It reminded me of the time I was a young student and shared a meal with Master Flying Rhino. I was too unnerved by his mere presence that I couldn't even eat properly as the food went stale. To share a meal with someone you knew could break you any time they want, to be in the presence of a superior beast. That feeling was especially intense for Kung Fu practitioners who dedicated their life to getting stronger. Especially if they were a stranger or a possible enemy. I remember being so frustrated and leaving as quickly as possible before making a beeline to the training hall where I trained for the whole day and night without even a wink of sleep. Master Flying Rhino came in the morning and told me he was impressed by my fighting spirit. He even taught me a few of his techniques and we separated on a good note. However, I think I was not on his good side anymore ever since I beat his son Master Thundering Rhino right after his accomplishment of slaying 10,000 serpents in the Valley of Woe. I couldn't help it. The dude got lost in his own fame and claimed that he was the strongest of his generation. I had to go to the Guangdong province and show him otherwise. In fact, I think he might even be hostile to me since I killed Vatcher, the commander of Anvil of Heaven when I escaped my prison. He was one of Master Flying Rhino's favorite students. As I got lost in my thoughts, I had already set up the table and put our meals in front of everyone. The Furious Five waited for me to first eat my food as they stared. I shook away my thoughts and took a look at the bowl of noodles in front of me. I smelled it and observed it carefully while the nervous pa took a seat beside me. Then, under the eyes of everyone, I started digging in. Seeing that, the Furious Five also started eating their food. It was good that they were treating me respectfully like a senior. I made quick work of the most delicious bowl of noodles I had ever had in my life, and after that, I slapped Pur on the back. I am glad I did not kill you. That was the most pleasant bowl of noodles I've ever had. I said seriously, and he gave me a smile which quickly turned unsure when he fully comprehended my sentence. Um, thank you, he said, unsure if it was right to thank me for not taking his life. In the end, he shrugged, seconds, most definitely, but got up with my bowl and returned with more noodles. I nodded in satisfaction when he put it in front of me. Maybe being a vegan is not so bad. I thought to myself and my eyes wandered to Crane. He visibly freaked out when we locked eyes. What's wrong with him? Pa sat back to his seat in a rather noisy manner due to his weight and then he tried to make a conversation. He was the most talkative among them and he was uncomfortable with the silence. So, you never had noodles like this in prison? He asked with no intention of offense in his tone but the others looked at him with wide eyes. Was it okay to bring up something like that to Tai Lung? They thought. Honestly, I did not care. Forget about noodles. 
I never got any food while I was imprisoned, I said which took Pabak by surprise. He was someone who loved and needed food. He could never imagine being without food. What? But I thought you were imprisoned for a long time. Twenty years. I said as I swallowed the noodles. In twenty years I never got food or water. That seemed to surprise even the Furious Five as they gave me a questioning look. But how did you survive for that long without food? Pa asked the main question as everyone listened to hear my answer. I did not want to give a long explanation about how I wasted minimal energy in my immobile state or how Chi helped me. Instead, a small, playful smile appeared on my face as I turned to the panda. I feed on my hatred and wrath to survive for all those years, I said with all the seriousness in my voice. Whoa! Pa said in awe, is that why you are so nice now? You ate all your hatred and wrath. I held back a laugh, exactly. I went back to eating my foot as Pa took in the information. Until it clicked that what I said didn't make too much sense. Wait, how did you dash? He was joking, Pa. Viper told him. Oh, the others chuckled seeing the gullible panda and the mood became a little less awkward. So, Dragon Warrior, tell me about yourself and how you became the Dragon Warrior out of all these masters. I asked, initiating a conversation. I wanted to make them all comfortable with my presence, even with all that had happened. Since I was going to live with them, there should not be any conflict between us. And technically, they were my juniors, so it was my responsibility to guide them and help them when they need it. Well, it all started when I was an egg. And then I was born to my father. Pa started retelling his stories from the very beginning. Tai Lung's POV, shall I repeat myself? To Mr. Chun, owner of a tavern near the outskirts of Mongolia. It is located in the village of Rice, the closest village to Chorgam prison. Tell him it's from Tai Lung, I said for the final time to the messenger duck. Yes, I will do as you say. The duck said, he also happened to be the same one I caught during my prison escape. After that, he took off from the training ground to deliver the money thrice the amount I owed and a proper letter of apology. I went into thought as I watched the messenger disappear into the horizon. It would be a lie to say I regret my actions but I knew I was wrong for the way I behaved on my way to home. Until I finally got the closure of home I didn't know I needed, I was quite violent and aggressive in what I did. Almost like a child who was upset but did not want to throw a proper tantrum. So he resorted to being very petty and intense. I guess being imprisoned for 20 years messed me up in some ways that I did not even realize. There was no need for violence in that tavern. I could just escape and no one would be able to catch up to me. It might be due to the battle I had with the Anvil of Heaven previously that I was so hot-blooded and so quick to initiate violence. Nevertheless, no one died. And I hope the money was enough to compensate for the broken tables. I was not sorry for the warriors who fought me, though. It would be disrespectful to them as warriors if I apologized for beating them up after they stood up so bravely for justice. I have also sent a letter to the rulers of Milan City which explains that the fight that occurred was a duel initiated by their so-called protector. Although he was a great warrior, he was a very bad guardian, blinded by the need for vengeance. And about the restaurant, I was not going to apologize like I did to Mr. Chun because they were the ones who denied me entry. In this world and era, it was the ultimate show of disrespect if a restaurant denied you food, even when you had the money to eat there. They were establishments that promised to feed the people food was the basic necessity to life that was universal. And to deny that even if they were criminals was viewed as disrespect. Whoever you are or whatever you do, you have the right to be able to buy food and eat for sustenance. The restaurant probably thought since they were popular and had guerrilla guards, they could deny me entry. It was also why they were so polite about it, like how people say no offense and proceed to say the most offensive shit ever. I was not going to take that level of disrespect. I turned around and left the training ground. Furthermore, I went to the training hall instead and when I entered, I was greeted with the familiar training equipment and obstacles. There were some changes to new equipment and an obstacle course, but the overall layout and the design were still the same. The hall was quite noisy and full of life as the Furious Five were currently in the middle of training. My eyes wandered around, carefully observing the hall until it fell on Shurfu who was watching everything from the side. I walked towards him and stood beside him. We observed the ongoing training for a while until I decided to break the silence between us. Good morning Shurfu, I said. Good morning son, he said while nodding and taking a brief glance at me. That single sentence threw me for a loop as I was caught completely off guard. But in the end, my heart felt at ease being called that. It's kind of unfair how I could... He could make me feel such emotions with just a single word. Father, I said, and this time it was Shurfu who was caught off guard as he lost balance.
He looked up at me, flabbergasted, but I remained stoic. It filled me with an odd sense of satisfaction seeing him just as affected, if not more, than I was. He coughed a few times to dispel his shock before he said, I was aware of what you did. That was truly admirable. I scoffed, it was nothing. It was the natural thing to do. I made a mistake. It is impossible to not make a mistake as long as we live and breathe. But we should always be able to accept our mistake and take responsibility for it. Shurfu looked at me with a raised eyebrow. That is indeed true. But I thought with your ego and strength, you wouldn't admit you can make a mistake. I know I am not perfect. I said with a laugh. It's my ability to learn from my mistakes and face them that truly sets me apart. Shurfu joined me in my laughter. You've changed, he said. I shook my head, I've grown. I looked at him and he was giving me a proud smile. Not only that, but I was taken aback, remembering the times when I would do literally anything to earn that smile. We shared a short moment together before we returned to watching the ongoing training. It was quite a sight even for me. The way they moved and the skills they possessed were indeed something worthy of being admired. Tell me what you think of them. Shurfu said, you fought them so you should know. Fight is a strong word. I said with a knowing smile, they are decent, decent huh? Shurfu said thoughtfully while rubbing his beard. That's a high praise coming from you. I guess I must be doing a good job then. He smiled. Well, don't be too sure. I said, they were decent. I said, and Shurfu turned to me with questioning eyes. What do you mean? I point at Viper. She is too nice. I point at Mantis. He's subpar and predictable. I point at Crane, fragile and too smart for his own good. Overthinking during fights. I point at Monkey, nothing noteworthy. But most importantly, I pointed at Tigress. She's the worst, completely unacceptable. Tigress with her keen senses heard my words and she turned to me, only to be hit with a log during her distraction. Like I said, it's unacceptable. They are decent when they fight together, but individually they are all below the standard. I said, the Furious Five were like parts of a powerful machine. Together, they were strong enough to even defeat the likes of Wu Bao, but alone, they were completely useless. I see. Well, they have been fighting together as a team since the beginning, so it would make sense if their Kung Fu developed to strengthen the team instead of their personal strength. Shurfu said thoughtfully, I will let them work on their individual fighting power. He said, maybe giving them solo missions will help? He went silent as he thought more about the idea. And anything you want to say about Tigris in specific? Shurfu asked. Well, she is definitely the strongest amongst this generation Furious Five. But with her talent and potential, she could be so much more. I said, you really think so? I know so. I nodded. It's just that she had not even found her true Kung Fu and she is stuck between imitating me and trying to control her ferocity. Shurfu coughed three times, that might be my fault. For the majority of her life, I was trying to teach her to control her strength and fight with precise technique, even though it was obvious she was more suited for hardcore style. After that realization, I pushed her to use your leopard style kung fu since you both have similar builds. So you have been trying to turn her into something she is not? Shurfu sighed, yes, I was ignorant. It was only recently that I learned I did not need to turn them into something else. Instead, I should teach them to be themselves. I don't have to turn you into me. I have to turn you into you. The line quoted in the third movie rang in my mind. I was treating them like I did you, desperately trying to turn them into something they were not. Shurfu admitted, I was a genius and even if I was able to learn every kung fu in the world, yet even I could never be something I was not. Silence descended on us again as the grunts and screams of the Furious Five filled the silence. Would you mind giving them a few pointers as their senior? It would be beneficial for them to learn from a different master and get another perspective. Shurfu offered. Are you sure? I asked, you know me, I am not gentle when it comes to training. By all means, go all out. I smiled before a question popped in my mind. Where's the dragon warrior? Oh, he works as a waiter in his father's noodle shop so he won't be able to train until evening comes, Shurfu said. I did not know if I should cry or laugh at that information. Let's just stay neutral. Okay, I said and stepped forward before I clapped my hands loudly, causing the training to stop as everyone looked at me. Juniors, I announced, it's your lucky day. Today we learn real Kung Fu. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.